he's 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 on a work release program down in Australia. There's a long, rich history of that in Australia, and uh, no, we're really delighted to have him back in Washington and very proud of the work that he's doing in Australia at uh, at uh, Sydney in the U.S. Study Center in University of Sydney. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a unique thing, you know, to go, I had the privilege of going to visit, and it's quite a unique thing to sit with, with a whole bunch of analysts who spend more time thinking about my country than I do, okay? So it was a, it was a real rich and marvelous experience, and very, very pleased for the opportunity to have, have you back and have you all here. Um, and uh, I just, let me just say, um, I'm really grateful that we have this opportunity today since since the time that that I was there um, of course Australia released its strategic review Peter Dean is kind of the, he, he, he really wrote it but we'll pretend Angus Houston did it uh, uh, but it was really wonderful that uh, the conversations that I had to learn about it you know it's an important thing we're such close countries in so many ways, but we don't see the world exactly the same way. And Americans are, have a kind of a bad habit when we have other countries that we like and they like us, we tend to think they think exactly like us. And that isn't the case, you know? I mean, Australia has its own perception of the security environment. Very important for us to listen to that. Um, it's not something that we do so often. I mean, um, you know, you. My mother once said, you know, that you've got two ears and one mouth, you should use them in that proportion, you know. Well, most Americans behave like they've got three mouths and one ear, you know. We tend to do an awful lot of talking, not enough listening. And I think today is an opportunity for us to do some listening together. We're going to have a good conversation. Michael, thank you. Welcome back to Washington. You know, you're, you are hereby paroled and you can come back permanent if you want to do that. Otherwise, you can keep going back and running a wonderful institution. So let me uh, let me get off the stage. We've got, I've got to disappear quick because the president of the Philippines is upstairs, or, and I'm supposed to be introducing that session. So I'm going to disappear on you. It's very rude, but uh, but if you'll indulge me, I will quickly get get going. And I think, Michael, you're going to take over. And let me turn to you. Would you please welcome Mike Green back to Washington? So it's, it's great to be back. This is, um, I was at CSIS for 15 years, and this is the best seminar I've run ever, because he can't fire me now. So, um, so we may get a little wild, who knows. Um, the uh, US Studies Center uh, was established um, in uh, 2007, but um, the idea was broached by then Prime Minister John Howard to then President George W. Bush. Um, I was in the Oval Office. I was the note taker um, for President Bush when I worked at the White House. And, and the idea was that the U.S.-Australia alliance, which is incredibly intimate, um, does not have a platform for debate, discussion, um, uh, consideration, education from different perspectives about all the things we do together. And uh, at the time, there was basically nothing. Now there's an Australia chair, um, very, very important under Charlie Adele. But the center was set up, and Charlie worked at the center in Sydney briefly. Um, it was set up to try to create that platform. Um, and I think the demand for that kind of public discourse about what we do uh, with Australia as allies, what Australia does with the U.S., is more uh, important than ever. Um, th those of you who have been in the government or the military know um, you go in to meet the commander of U.S. Army Pacific, and one of his two deputies is an Australian general. I remember taking President Bush, uh, taking a carrying bags, Kavan Mochi for President Bush, on the way to the US uh, command in Korea, and his briefer on the threat was Australian. So, you know, when you're in government, or if you're in finance or energy, um, you know how intimate with Five Eyes and everything else the US and Australia are, but the public platforms to discuss um, what these two democracies are doing are very limited historically, very limited compared to uh, Europe with the German Marshall Fund, uh, Japan with the Japan chair here and programs everywhere, Korea um, with uh, the Chosun Ilbo, Jungang Ilbo forums, with Asan. 
Um, so the kind of infrastructure for public discourse about big decisions um, that Australia and America make has been historically quite limited. Um, and uh, we are facing really, really big decisions. Um, and we'll talk about that in the two panels we do today. We're not mostly going to talk about the US-Australia relationship. We're going to talk about the world we face um, and whether or not we're fit for purpose um, to, uh, to move forward. The, the other uh, reason um, for uh, uh, th this, this, this kind of platform, this kind of discussion, is because it's not just the U.S. and Australia anymore. It's the U.S. Uh, we're the U.S. Studies Center in Sydney, but, but we're really, I like to say, the U.S. parentheses, Japan, Korea, Quad, NATO, Allies and Partners Studies Center. Because one thing that's very, very clear to me in Sydney is how strong Japan-Australia security ties are and overall relations. We, did, we do surveys at the U.S. Studies Center, and over 70% of Australians say they want a security treaty with Japan like the one they have with the U.S. Um, remarkable um, synergies. And um, increasingly now with Korea, uh, with India, the Quad will be held in Sydney in a few weeks. Um, so these are issues that aren't even bilateral anymore that increasingly they're networked alliances on issues of defense, diplomacy, tech, development. So we'll try to touch on those and, um, and get our experts from CSIS and the U.S. Studies Center to, to help make sense of it. The first panel I invite uh, uh, up here, um, uh, Peter, and I'll introduce them as they come in, sort of like the, um, uh, the Washington uh, commanders coming on the field, cheerleaders <laughs> and smoke. And uh, so um, at playing quarterback, <laughs> um, uh, so Dr. Peter Dean, uh, I'm going to sit here. So Pete is a colleague, friend of many, many years, um, uh, historian, um, author of um, multiple books, including a fantastic uh, book, uh, most recently on MacArthur and the New Guinea and Guadalcanal campaign. Um, he is um, what Charlie Adele would call a bad historian. <laughs> in other words, a historian who actually cares about policy and wants to apply the lessons of history and strategy. And it was for that reason, Pete heads our foreign policy and defense team. But it was with that background that Pete was asked by the, 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 the government to join the Defense Strategic Review. And uh, it, it, as John Hamry just revealed, he was the principal drafter for the document, which is, by everyone's account, the most significant change in strategic thinking in Australia since at least the 1980s, when uh, Dr. Paul Dibb did a senior, similar review for then Defense uh, Minister Kim Beasley. Um, and uh, uh, Mia hammond Airy uh, heads our uh, Emerging Technology Program. Um, uh, Mia has a doctorate from ANU and is an expert on big data and intelligence and policy and society. She's worked in the Australian Federal Police and the Navy and elsewhere, uh, headed the um, uh, work that uh, uh, another think tank in Australia, ASPE, did on, on uh, disinformation, Chinese disinformation in the Pacific. Um, uh, Victor Cha um, is, um, I don't know what he does. <laughs> uh, Victor is um, uh, the uh, senior director, uh, I don't, actually he has the same title as I have and I don't remember what it, <laughs> the senior vice president for Asia and the Korea chair is also a vice dean at Georgetown um, and needs no further introduction but um, worked with me in the NSC um, and um, is running Asia Now uh, programs here at CSIS. And, um, and Charlie Adele, um, the Australia chair, worked at the US Study Center. Um, I think Charlie was the first one who actually told me that working there was an option. Um, and, and runs the, uh, the Australia chair here at CSIS. Charlie and I have a, uh, uh, his dissertation was on John Quincy Adams. And, um, and I write a lot about John Quincy Adams. So we, we have an agreement that in any public engagement, we have to talk about John Quincy Adams. So if you wonder why I ask him, what would John Quincy Adams think about emerging technology? <laughs> That's why. So um, I'm going to join them. We'll have a discussion, then we'll open it up for comments and questions. And then I'll turn it over to Matt Goodman for an economic security panel next. Uh, is this mic on? So um, we'll do maybe two, maybe three rounds of questions, then open it up uh, to, the, to the audience. Can you hear me OK? Um, so let me start with Pete. So, um, so the Defense Strategic Review, as I said, was the most significant um, reconceptualization of Australia's security environment and strategy since the 1980s, arguably for a security environment that is harsher than the 1980s. So, so some have said it's the most significant rethink since 1942. Um, and you had the pen, 
And it is a long document, so I won't ask you to summarize the whole thing, but I think for our framing comments, it'd be really helpful to hear the front end of the review. What was the strategic assessment? What was the security environment um, that you explained to the government that necessitated some of these big changes in force posture, force structure, and so forth? Thanks, Mike, and, and it's really fantastic to be here. And yeah, I, I had the very, very great privilege of working for uh, His Excellency Stephen Smith and Sir Angus Houston um, to be their principal advisor and, and principal author for their defence strategic review. So I'd like to say to everyone, anything you like in the document, I'm happy to lay claim for, and anything you dislike, it's clearly Stephen and Sir Angus's fault. Um, but th that was a real, real privilege. And uh, in terms of framing the debate, at the very beginning of this, uh, when it was announced, uh, they had a press conference and Sir Angus stood up and, you know, he's a former Chief of Air Force, a former Chief of the Defence Force, one of the most distinguished um, military professionals in Australia in a very long time. And the comment he made that really captured the essence of that press conference, that th these were the most challenging strategic times that he'd seen in his very long and very distinguished career. The document extrapolates that and actually talks about these strategic circumstances and the risks that Australia face in them are now radically different to any other time since 1945. And that's how the document frames Australia's position in the world at the moment. Um, we, we were lucky enough in Australia, you know, we live at the, the bottom of the Indo-Pacific. Geography um, can, is both you know, personified by the, the tyranny of distance in many respects um, for Australia. But in, in the Cold War, for instance, that was actually quite good for Australia. Um, we weren't exactly on the front line. We weren't uh, sitting just off the Fulda Gap um, and places like that. But what the document talks about now is the rise of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic centre of gravity in the world. Increasing strategic competition means we, we now have the power of proximity in Australia. We sit on that hinge between the Indian and the Pacific, um, Pacific Oceans with that great connectivity we have through the ASEAN countries into the rest of the region. The document also talks about the US no longer being the unipolar leader of that Indo-Pacific region. And this was a significant statement that the document um, started to lay out. And that US-China strategic competition, it, it said, was the defining feature of our region and the defining feature of our time. Now, it also highlighted particularly, and, and he reflecting on what's happened um, in the region generally, but also what's happening, for instance, in the conflict in Ukraine, that the character of the conflict conflicts uh, happening around the world and the character of the threats in that region has also changed. So you're getting a confluence of things the document um, outlines that are coming together. And probably one of the most important things that it highlights and it emphasises there is regional military modernisation and specifically talks there about Chinese military expansion that's been going on in recent decades, which it talks about as being the largest and most ambitious since the, since the Second World War. But the real problem with that is being done without transparency and without reassurance from China about how that expansion, how that military power is going to be used and, um, within the region. And of course, in particular, it brings home um, about China's involvement in strategic competition in Australia's near region, um, particularly highlighting, of course, uh, the South Pacific, Southwest Pacific, which is Australia's front yard or backyard, depending on where you're standing, but of course, Australia sees itself very much as part of that Pacific family. And uh, as we saw in our recent election campaign with the discussions between the Solomon Islands and China about security pacts and operations there, that really brought home to the Australian people that strategic competition wasn't something that happened somewhere else. It was something that happened right on Australia's doorstep. It was something that was happening in Australia's community. And that was particularly important. So um, the argument then, the document went from that framework required, as you said, a really complete reassessment of the way that the um, Australian Defence Force was structured, the way it did its strategy, and the way it was organised. And the panel talks about um, you know, things you mentioned in your introduction being fit for purpose. And one of the real, I think, on one sense, honest and open comments, but jarring for many people, was it said that the Australian Defence Force is not fit for purpose for this new strategic era. So, because basically it had come out of this era of what was known as the Defence of Australia, which Paul Dibb, as you mentioned, had outlined. And what did articulate it was defence of Australia against low level or escalated low level threats. And what the DSR puts really at the centre of it is now this is about the defence of Australia in a major power strategic competition environment and that is quantitatively and qualitatively different. And that requires a movement from that defence of Australia doctrine to what's now being called uh, national defence, which is a more whole of government, actually whole of nation effort that's required.
the harnessing of, um, of all elements of national power, as our Foreign Minister um, Penny Wong was reiterating just before DSR was released, is going to be the cornerstone of that. So it's a real significant reframing of our region. And fundamental to that is the end of warning time. So Dib's document and from the 70s, defence planning have had 10 years of strategic warning time that they were able to use that basis on. The former Morrison government ended that 10 years of warning time in 2020. That was reiterated in this particular document. And, uh, and what this is, is a, is a call to action about what are you going to do in that strategic environment with the end of that warning time. So when you think about a US alliance in the region that's premised on zero warning time, it's the US-Korea alliance. And the Kach Kapshida, we fight tonight, joint command and control. So the, the implication of zero warning time and great power competition is a much higher level of interdependence. Historically, Australian forces have pretty much always been there. But in Vietnam, the Gulf, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, um, there, was, there was some sort of luxury is not the right word, but I'll use it, luxury of time and distance to decide how, where, when Australia wants to plug in. That, that's pretty much gone now, isn't it? It's, 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 it's a whole new world, and it, it creates a level of dependency uh, or interdependence, interdependence. Cu cutting both ways. Cutting, uh, absolutely. It's very yeah. new for this alliance. Yeah, and obviously America is a much larger power than Australia. It's, a, it's an asymmetric partnership that we have, but that asymmetry, the distance of that asymmetry is shrinking. Australia is becoming more and more important to US security um, as well as the United States, as the document says. So, you know, because of these changes, the relationship with the United States has to grow, it has to adapt, and it's even more important to Australia now than it has been since, you know, it was signed in 1951, and of course, going back to the, the famous speech of our Prime Minister John Curtin in 1942, at the height of that, the Pacific War that Australia now looks to America for its security. So it's a really significant change. So Victor, one of the manifestations of this that I've seen is um, uh, it, 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 when his, um, uh, 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 you know, not boss, but uh, client for the Defense Strategy Review, Richard Marles, Deputy Prime Minister, Defense Minister, talks about um, uh, Australian Security and the Alliance, he uses the word sovereignty a lot, um, it, which sounds very familiar for those of us who do US, Japan, US, Korea, because sovereignty, you should say, is such a key question in alliance that's asymmetrical like this. On the other hand, our surveys show um, uh, at the US Study Center that Americans who have generally been very supportive of the alliance support it for somewhat different reasons now. Um, about roughly 40% of Americans said the alliance makes the U.S. safer, uh, historically. Starting two years ago, 60% say the alliance with Australia and Japan and Korea makes us safer. So this, the public understands the implications of greater independence. <coughs> U.S. needs Australia, Japan, Korea to have more capability, but these countries want to retain some sovereignty. Maybe you can give us context in how you see this trend looking at Korea, Japan, um, really impressive State visit, or visit, state visit by President Yoon, you know, Japan Alliance moving forward, but similar kinds of questions, I think, across all the alliances. Sure. How do you see it? Sure. Um, well, thanks uh, for the question, and thanks for, uh, for the opportunity to be here with you. It's good to see you back here. Um, uh, and thanks to everybody from the U.S. Study Center. Really, it's great to be with you all. Um, so I think this point about interdependent security is an important one. Um, the, the United States has always had a particular architecture that it created for Asia, the Asia Pacific, the Indo-Pacific, uh, but it was one in which arguably security was asymmetric. I mean, it was the United States as the hub providing all of this security, largely private goods, to all of these other countries, including Australia, Korea, Japan, and others. And um, the, the you know, the current iteration of the Indo-Pacific strategy is one I think that's based in this, in this core notion of security being interdependent. Like you said, Americans have a better understanding of the, of the role that these alliances play, not just in our provision of security to those countries, but the alliances providing security for, for Americans. And I think that's a very important and different way to be looking at the U.S. Architect, U.S. security architecture in the Indo in the Indo Pacific today, um, clearly it's organized around peer competition and the abandonment of the responsible stakeholder template uh, template with China. Um, as you know well, things like the Quad are not new. In fact, you and I were at the inception of the Quad that 
Christmas. For, for those who don't know, yeah. Victor came to join me at the NSC from Georgetown. I said, come in the week between Christmas and New Year's, it would be very, very quiet. His first day of the Indian Ocean tsunami happened, and we were the only ones in the office. So his, the Korea expert was suddenly doing humanitarian relief in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. So. Our South Asia expert and our Southeast, our South Asia expert was skiing in Tahoe in, or something. In Belize, and our, our Southeast Asia expert was skiing in the Alps or something, and they weren't coming back. <laughs> they, they told us they weren't coming back. Um, but you know, clearly, uh, the, the, the more recent iterations, I think, are, are different in a couple of respects. I mean, the first is that they are very, they're, they're, it's very deeply based in sort of reestablishing uh, trust, confidence in the bilateral relationships, right? We went through a period, as we all know, where uh, these bilateral relationships were uh, deeply damaged, I would say. Um, uh, countries like Japan and Australia tried to put their base, best face on it, but you know, the reservoir of trust and goodwill, I think, was quite depleted um, at the end of the Trump administration. So reestablishing those bilateral relationships was, was quite important. And then it was also this notion of seeing our, seeing our allies as, um, our alliance is not simply as transactional, uh, but as embedded in values and important power assets for the United States, again, going back to the, this point. I mean, traditionally, we look at as alliances as instruments of power uh, accretion. Um, but there was a view in the United States that looked at these alliances not as power accretion, but as sapping our power. And that was clearly not the view that the Biden administration takes on this, again, with regard to interdependent security. Um, and then again, something we're all familiar with is this, this networking now of the hub and spokes relationship. Uh, I think Edgar and the administration, they referred to it as lattice work. I think that's the metaphor that they've chosen. It's not my favorite. A lattice work just doesn't sound very sturdy. It sounds scary, <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it's like, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna right, Mark? It's gonna like blow away in the wind <laughs> and like mess up the rest of your garden. Um, uh, but you know what it is, as we all know, is this, it's really a diversi diversification of the geometry <coughs> right, of uh, the Indo-Pacific architecture. So if what we had were line segments before, US, Australia, US, Japan. We're seeing trilaterals, quadrilaterals. We're seeing all these different new geometries of Asia that in, in aggregate are, are much more powerful than simply the, the, this hub and spokes. Um, and then I would say, um, but and clearly this is, this is being well practiced in the security area. You know, lots of different exercises taking place. We're all aware of them. New, new formations, new types of exercises. But the new area in which this is now moving is, um, is, uh, is something we'll talk about in the second panel is economic security. And there, there I think, you know, frankly, we're, we're learning by doing. Um, I think, you know, we're, we've made some mistakes. Uh, in terms of some of the things that we've created to protect te technology and other things. But, uh, but I think those are natural growing pains. Mm -hmm. It's all kind of new to us, so we're all trying. And it's important for allies to speak up and say, like, this is not right, this is not right. That's the only way. And I think the administration is learning. I think in both the Korea and the Philippines summits this week, there's language in both joint statements that kind of acknowledge that there needs to be much more um, uh, sort of from the ground level up, consensus-based rulemaking and decision-making, and so I think that that's good. Uh, the other area, which I will not talk about right now, but I think where the, this coalition diplomacy really needs to do a better job is in dealing with the economic coercion, but, yeah. but we can talk about that next. Yeah, we, and I think the next panel will as well, and it's, uh, it was just, I mean, Australia was the first to really stand up to yeah. economic coercion. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, Japan did in the in the in the rare earth metal embargo by diversifying, and but it was Australia that stood up and actually said bring it bring it on. Actually, that's not an Australianism, but <laughs> um, make my day, whatever it was, <laughs> um, and set an example. Um, real quick, Victor, the other thing you know, in addition to the um, the networking, the lattice, um, the, um, the interdependence, um, the other thing that's very new for people like us who've written about and worked on alliances is um, how much the American public, in, in the polls we've done, the Congress, um, Republican and Democratic administrations, um, are prepared to support uh, asymmetrical capabilities by our allies. I mean, the, the history of our alliances, as you've written in, 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 power, in power Game, is, 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 you know, as they said of NATO, it's to keep the, 
Russians out, the German Americans in, and the Germans down. And you know, the joint and combined command in Korea was also about making sure Korea didn't move unilaterally. Um, uh, the U United States did not encourage Australia to develop asymmetrical uh, uh, capabilities. Unthinkable that, that the U.S. even five years ago would have approved nuclear-powered submarines being transferred. And then Japan's the most remarkable of all with the support for standoff strikes. So um, th that, is, that is very new. Do we have a handle on what that means for coordination of strategy and, and, um, and, and escalation control and everything else? Yeah, well, I mean, so I think you're, you're, right, you're absolutely right. That is, that is very new, and I think it's, it's certainly a function of growing confidence and trust in our allies as being very capable partners, but, it, uh, but it's also a function of the external environment, right? The external environment has changed dramatically from when we were in government. I mean, we had our problems when we were in government, but we certainly didn't have this trifecta of a, you know, of a war in Europe uh, you know, China building 1,500 nuclear warheads by the end of, in, end of the year, and then North Korea on this missile rampage. Um, and so the external envi environment really is compelling in that sense. Um, but again, it wouldn't happen if uh, at the same time there wasn't this confidence in the alliances. Um, but as, you, as, as your question suggests, there still needs to be a lot of work going forward in terms of coordinating uh, uh, coordinating strategy, escalation control, and, and a variety of other very important uh, issues. So Mia, one of the um, uh, core um, challenges in this environment is, um, is the information domain. And um, the often very effective use of disinformation, misinformation, um, by China, Russia, um, but in the Pacific, by China. And, um, Democracies on their own are not always great at organizing these kind of um, uh, uh, campaigns to deal with disinformation and narratives, let alone democracies working together as allies to do it. Um, you, you've done a lot of work on this in government and, uh, and in think tanks. Are, are we, the US, Australia, Japan, other allies, Europe, are we, are we up for this? <laughs> are we ready for this? Because you and I may read this misinformation uh, in social media in Vanuatu or the Solomons and think it's ridiculous, but it's effective. So are we, are we fit for purpose on this one? The short answer is I think in, in contrast to um, both of your questions, actually this is an area where there still is room for a lot of improvement. Um, you know, the digital landscape has inadvertently created a, an ecosystem or information environment that is really vulnerable to exploitation and interference. Um, in a piece I wrote ahead of Osmin uh, 2022, I argued that the military approach to the information environment is really helpful to developing solutions um, in, in kind of a broader information operations space. And I just wanted to briefly take you through that and, and um, hopefully take some questions. So for those of you that don't know, the military focus is how human beings use information to influence the direction and outcome of competition and conflict how people get their information and understand their world, which includes the information itself, the systems we receive it on, as well as the social context in which it's embedded. This provides a really useful framework for how we address challenges like you've just alluded to in the Pacific, and, and that is in three prongs. So the informational content itself, which is often a topic uh, or the focus in the civilian world, the digital landscape or infrastructural platforms, technology that we get that information, and then the area that the military is focused on the most, which is cognitive um, or human resilience. The information environment, I guess, then encompasses everything from human influence right through to information warfare. And like the other two have mentioned, from peace to acute large-scale conflict. It is discussed not just by global leaders and defence chiefs, but by citizens around the world, from Sydney to Kiev. And we can think about the Chinese influence in the Pacific, you know, specifically about how uh, information influence operations were targeted against key decision makers prior to the security um, agreement being signed with China. Uh, it was coordinated. You know, you can see that. You, but you can also see our, our own families asking questions about COVID-19 misinformation uh, to the Russian elections. I'd also suggest perhaps it, it is also in our own back door. You know, think about the implications of Twitter promoting views using algorithms over other views. And I recently saw, I think it was today, that um, 
you know, they've removed, they removed the propaganda flags and government um, affiliation flags a few weeks ago. But I saw today that uh, NORAD is no longer a verified uh, entity on Twitter, but fake NORAD has a blue check. And that's, I mean, it's kind of laughable, but think about what would happen in a disaster scenario where journalists and the media are going to find uh, information. So there are some really significant challenges in our own information environment. And viewing the problems of mis- and disinformation in this uh, military informa information environment way sorry, is critical because the same systems are used for data exchange, they're used for financial infrastructure, but also social entertainment. Um, our digital infrastructure is used for national security, advertising. It's a, it's a whole spectrum and it's now completely interdependent. And that means that the speed, reach, volume, and precision of this disinformation generated, in this case, by foreign adversaries, can target US and Australian decision making. It affects our reputation, and it can impact our social cohesion at home, which we've seen in a number of countries. So this, I guess, susceptibility of the digital landscape to disinformation, interference, and inter in, um, exploitation, I think needs to be really high on our alliance agenda. The US and Australia, I think, have a great opportunity here to show real leadership in the region, to, to kind of demonstrate how to strengthen resilience to information environment and interference. I think there, is a, there are many different challenges across those three, uh, the three spectrums in different countries. The Pacific is obviously going to have different challenges to Australia, um, you know, to Japan, to Korea. But I argue that as a first step, our nations should establish a bilateral 1.5 track task force to collaborate on these issues. Um, and they should, they should have the same three working groups that the military definition has. So informational, uh, infrastructural and cognitive resilience. And I'd suggest an early place to start here might be um, interoperability standards and integration, as well as oversight of solutions. I think our two countries can start, but also across the region and continue that network approach uh, to harden our resilience in competition and also in conflict. So the, my sense is the forensics would be an area where Five Eyes are very aligned and Japan and others understand and can see the campaigns and can see increasingly uh, joint operations by Russia and China or learning, because uh, the Russians are better at this stuff generally. Um, so we're, we're, we're aligning on the friends because we can see what's happening, we know what's happening, we can quickly compare disinformation. It's a lot harder to align on, well, and, and we can align on resilience. You know, uh, 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 USAID, DFAT, you know, JICA, we can, help support um, journalists and platforms for information, mm -hmm. the Global Engagement Center and the State Department. We can help with resilience. The part where I sense it's very, very hard is the counter narratives. So a good example might have been AUKUS. Um, and the Chinese narrative on AUKUS was pretty effective. And um, eventually uh, DFAT uh, came around and the IAEA said this is not nuclear proliferation, so on and so forth. But my sense was it was very hard uh, for the governments to clear a set of talking points across alliances. That piece is pretty, pretty tricky, isn't it? And also, you don't want to do propaganda. Right. So uh, that last piece, sort of counter narratives, is that, if we figure that out, is there a way to think about it? Maybe this 1.5 track group will get the solution. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I do, I'd actually challenge the first point, though. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I think that we, are, as a Five Eyes community, are particularly good at identifying it as it happens or after it happens. Yeah, I'm talking I, about after. Yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily think we're particularly good at identifying it early yeah. or um, perhaps the way that the, the environment is being shaped ahead of those um, operations. And I, I think there's space to improve that. The, the counter narratives are difficult because they do go right to the values and um, you know the beliefs of different societies. It's much more difficult to align those <laughs> in advance. There's an element of truth. Uh, about colonialism or Australia's history of the Pacific, there's always an element of truth that resonates. That, that makes it hard. In fact, is maybe AI is, is part of the solution for counter narratives. Perhaps. No. <laughs> chat G, could chat make it worse. GTB, <laughs> chat GTB, whatever. Chat GTB. Can I, I just can, yeah. two fingers on this? So, um, I will slightly disagree with the second point on resiliency in the sense that... I, I leave this place and I come back and everybody's <laughs> disagreeing with me all of a sudden. <laughs> He thought it was just us that right. backed right. at it, yeah. But um, on resilience, just because, I mean, even if we talk about sort of the United States and Australia and Japan, the amount of resources that China has put into disinformation, um, 
and penetrated um, you know, many, much of the global south. By comparison to what the State Department, for example, is going to use for this, it's like, it's like, yeah. it's like pennies in a fountain, right? It's not, uh, so I think that's, that makes it difficult. And then on the counter narrative, um, like I think you can tell me, I, I think we're culturally, we're just not good at this because we're not good at propagandizing. And we don't like to go after others and criticize, and, you know, pull up sort of the Chinese narrative and say this is like crap. This is like not real. Like we're not, we're not well. Um, w our disposition is not to do either of those things, right? And so I think that it it, it re requires us to change the way we do things. I think and put a lot more resources. To it. So Charlie, what would John Quincy Adams do about <laughs> <laughs> chat? Um, uh, just looking at the alliance as a whole. Uh, institutionally, mm. are we structured for the competition, the asymmetrical capabilities Australia is developing, the, 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 the zero warning time, uh, uh, force structure, force posture decisions, you know, the difficulty of dealing with it. Is the alliance, you know, Osman and the way we sort of traditionally have done the alliance, is that fit for purpose? Yeah, uh, let me go even broader than that, Mike. Uh, because as long as you bring in John Quincy I, Look, my job uh, when I was in Australia was to translate Americanese. Uh, now my job is to translate Australian into American. And so I think uh, all of our questions are hovering around uh, the title of this panel discussion, Are We Fit for Purpose?, which doesn't exactly translate to American. Uh, and in fact, when we had uh, Richard Marles, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Defense Minister here in July, uh, I got a query saying, here's the title of his speech that he's going to give, uh, Making the U.S.-Australian Alliance Match Fit. And I said, please don't give that speech. No one knows what a match is uh, in America. We have games. We certainly have competitions. We don't really do matches. Uh, but the intent behind that is really thinking about whether or not our alliance, but really more broadly, our alliances and partnerships are up to the task of this degrading security environment that Pete laid out. Um, and I think in order to answer that, you really have to kind of peel back uh, two different parts of that. First is, uh, what is the purpose of what we're trying to do? And what are the efforts that we've undertaken to get after that? Uh, let me kind of start up front and saying, I think the answer is yes, but a tentative and a qualified yes. Uh, and if you think about what the purposes are, what the tasks are, what the objectives are, I I'd lay out, just so that we can have lots to disagree with or add to or edit, that there are three things that we're trying to think about what we're trying to accomplish in the region. The first is, can we modernize our alliances to respond to the challenges, you've just laid them out, of the 21st century, uh, dealing with climate change, dealing with the new information and emerging technology uh, atmosphere, dealing with strategic competition. Right? The second one is, can we make sure that our alliances are set to ensure a free, open, prosperous, and secure Indo-Pacific? Right? Providing alternatives, but also allowing countries to protect their sovereignty. And then the third one, which isn't really a secret, uh, even if it doesn't come up until the third one generally, is do our alliances and partnerships effectively serve as a deterrent, um, sure to Russia, sure to North Korea, but to China uh, for their increasingly aggressive actions. And if you look at what the Biden administration has undertaken, right, uh, repeatedly they say alliances and partnerships are at the heart of how we see foreign policy. And you can actually understand the logic quite clearly here, right, that it was to, I think, restore and rebuild some strategic trust after the last administration, uh, to demonstrate American commitment uh, to the region, but also, and this is where we've started to go in this conversation, to change how fundamentally the U.S. thinks about its allies and to begin to help them strengthen themselves. We won't say that the era of primacy is over, where the U.S. can do whatever it wants, but the era of primacy is over. And the new era that we're embarked upon now is one where we want our most trusted allies to become stronger. So look at their early investments, right, that the Biden administration put in. They wrapped up lingering cost-sharing agreements with both Japan and South Korea. Um, they began expanding across the board uh, what the U.S. was doing with Australia. Uh, it was a two-way dance with the Philippines, really, which you're hearing upstairs. You're not hearing it because you guys are all thankfully here, but really repairing that relationship and continuing to push forward the U.S.-India relationship. And it's really begun to bore, bear fruit 
although on uneven paces, right? I mean, remarkable transformation of the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance, right? Uh, both on force posture, on standoff strike, uh, potentially on command and control. Uh, if we look at the Yoon visit last week, uh, we now see a raft of new agreements coming on. If we look at the U.S.-India relationship, we see a move to push it into emerging technologies and make sure that that defense and industrial partnership is better. And yes, when we come to Australia, we'd say, of course, AUKUS, but look beyond AUKUS too, because it's not only in under the sea, it's over the sea, it's up in the air, and it's land-based forces, all of which are going to be in Australia at some point soon. And of course, with the Philippines too, we're now seeing the announcement of nine new sites from which the U.S. can flow forces and personnel through. So, you know, when I step back from all this, uh, what I see is the United States working to empower and strengthen its allies where they want to go and not dictate at them what they need to be doing. I mean, look at AUKUS, look at standoff strike, look at the loosening of missile restrictions on the Koreans, uh, look at the deepening of security uh, integration with the Philippines. So look, uh, everyone should feel very good about this, right? This is good, this is good news, but there are really some big challenges here. And let me just point to three uh, that I see. Um, the first is in resources. Everyone has larger ambitions because the security environment has changed. That's good. Uh, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? Uh, that is a national debate, a national conversation that is happening in the United States, in Japan, uh, in South Korea, and especially in Australia right now. Uh, we had AUKUS, we had the DSR, but we haven't had the budget yet. So I think people are going to be watching very closely about where the resources align. Uh, second point is urgency and timelines. Uh, Pete said, right, no longer a 10-year warning window. Okay, so if we're not dealing with a deterrence problem that maybe materialize, materializes like in 2040 or in 2050, but we're actually dealing with a deterrence problem that has already materialized, how quickly and with what sense of urgency are different allies and partners getting after that? And the final one I'll say, just because I want to take a knock at Latticeworks as well, um, <laughs> or networks. Uh, look, these are all the right uh, impetus and direction in my mind. But really, it kind of skips around the question a little bit, I think, because if we talk about uh, you know, upgraded bilateral security uh, relationship A plus reinvigorated trilateral partnership B plus newly institutionalized quadrilateral relationship C, what we're really asking, I think, is does A plus B plus C equal deterrence of China? And I think the answer is no, uh, or at least not yet. Uh, so when I step back from this, Mike, I mean, I really see a terrific start and a tremendous amount of work that we have in front of us. So on the last one, I think the, we need to bring back this concept that has um, faded a bit um, in uh, deterrence theory, which is the difference between deterrence and dissuasion. Um, deterrence is you threaten me or you get hit. Dissuasion is we, you have to stop and think about the consequences in a, more, in a broader sense. Um, I think things like the Quad, the trilateral security, uh, 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 the cooperation with the uh, U.S., Japan, Australia, these are not based on treaty commitments. It's not, you know, there's not a, a, a clear and present uh, deterrent in the sense that you will be hit, but it has a dissuasion effect, which is the Quad is not meant to be a military alliance, but if it were, you'd have an incredibly difficult submarine web that Chinese ships would have to get through to provide half of China's floral carbons. Well, that's not where we are. So dissuasion is different from deterrence. I, personally, I think it's a mistake to think that the Quad or even the U.S. Toronto strategy is or deterrence. I, it, I think it's dissuasion, and that is a phrase, the distinction between dissuasion and deterrence, deterrence has fallen out of favor, but it's a useful, useful way to think about it. Primacy is fascinating. The DSR says uh, this, we're no longer in an era of U.S. primacy. A lot of Australian journalists asked me if the U.S. was insulted by that. Um, it's like, tell, tell us something we don't know. <laughs> But, but primacy, you're the historian. I mean, when has the U.S. really had primacy? You know, 1945, June 1950 maybe, and uh, you know, briefly in the early 90s perhaps. Most of American strategic history has been a history of multipolarity and contested environments in the, uh, in the Asia Pacific. So it's not an unfamiliar thing mm -hmm. 
for the for the muscle memory of, um, of of the U.S. strategic community, I think. Yeah, no, thank you for teeing up John Quincy Adams on a silver platter, because of course during the 19th century, no less the 18th century, America had anything but primacy and struggled it. No, I mean that's not really where we need to take the conversation. But uh, you know, let's be honest that we have been thinking about primacy for the last three decades. So. What we had been thinking about, the Cold War, I mean, uh, okay, we were struggling there, but during the Cold War, America constantly was fearful that it had already slipped behind. Uh, in the run-up to World War II, we knew that we had slipped behind. It's really the last 30 plus years where I think this idea that America can overawe any potential competitor in more than one location at once has really kind of woven its way into American strategic DNA. And I think, if nothing else, over the last five years, over the last six years, and certainly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, that has shattered that uh, idea here in Washington. Let me try one more thing on you and then open it up for questions and comments. Fascinating for me in, in Sydney and in Canberra to go to uh, 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 public panels where for two hours you can have this kind of conversation and the word China never comes up. It's the exact same conversation as Pete knows, but China never comes up. People sometimes say, you know we're talking about the seed country. It starts with C and it ends with A. And Canada. Well, Eat those guys. When you, say Canada, when you say Canada, all the Americans nod. <laughs> uh, Cuba, what's the other one? Cambodia. Cambodia. There's one more. China. So um, uh, the, the discourse, this is sort of you as well, Mia, the discourse, the, uh, the strategic assumptions that, 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 that Seoul sees, that Tokyo sees, Canberra, uh, London, Washington, largely lining, but the discourse is not. I mean, in some ways you can't get American officials and members of Congress to stop talking about China. They're, you know. But in, in Australia, it's, it's not even on the narrative often. Uh, the, the new Indo-Pacific strategy from Korea, I don't think mentions China even once or maybe once, um, and Japan somewhere in the middle. The, the Japanese have a 2,000 year history of talking about China, so it, rolls off the lips more easily. But can we do this, I'll go down the line, in terms of strategy, aligning, uh, aligning um, uh, uh, operations, making the case for resources and budgets, information campaigns, can we do this if our allies and partners, uh, even as intimate as in the US and Australia, talk about this publicly in such uh, either very polite or impolite ways? Let's start with you, Charlie, we'll go down the line. I don't think so. Uh, so let me step back that uh, when I was still living in Sydney, when I was working at U.S. Studies Center, uh, we wrote a report, uh, The Future of the U.S.-Australian Relationship in an Era of Great Power Competition. So that in and of itself is a euphemism, because in an era of great power competition means China. Uh, we rolled out the report at Australian Parliament House. We had two dozen members of parliament listening to it. Uh, and at the end of it, a newly elected parliamentarian stood up and said, uh, look, uh, I am buying what you are selling. Um, how do we talk about this? How do I discuss this with my constituents? Uh, and I said two things. One, ask the one with the right accent, not me. But if you do want advice, um, I think you have to name exactly what it is that you're talking about. I know that there's a delicate dance to be done with Australia's major trading uh, partner. 40%, as much as 40% of Australia's trade in the past has gone to China. That is the most of any advanced uh, nation in the world. It's down now from 40%. But really, if you think about talking with your neighbors, how can you possibly ask them to pay a larger premium on defense budgets and to countenance greater risk that your country is willing to bear if you're not leveling with them about why you were doing that and why you think by making those investments you're going to produce strategic equilibrium and not simply escalation. So I think it's really hard to hope that our government, by not naming the threat, might somehow get the right resourcing to actually take it on. And, you know, Mia, in the information domain, is, can we, do we have to keep saying starts with C and ends with A? Um, so I'm going to step back a bit too and go, but I will say yes, um, mm. with a caveat. I, I think, I, and I do think it, behind the scenes there is more alignment perhaps, but I think that there is room in alliances to have different opinions. Um, I think we're not trying to become 
the same. We are trying to have a diversity of opinions. There does need to be, as you've just pointed out, an agreement on the goal. And if that goal is a free, open and prosperous Indo-Pacific, I think that is a goal that we agree with, that we can all agree and share different perspectives on how we might achieve that. As it becomes pointier, that obviously needs, that alignment needs to get closer. As the diversity of opinions, you know, on, on economic coercion, for example, Australia has very specific um, you know, experiences and so opinions from Australia are going to have a different perspective. Yep. Yep. I, I do think as, as you are confronting more specific challenges, um, not just an entire, uh, you know, kind of conflict, co competition, sorry, as you narrow that down in, into specific challenges, of course, that language has to become more precise. But I think... And it's going to inevitably be different because the US is big and we may not have primacy, but we're big, we can say things and get away with it. In a, in a way that New Zealand right. couldn't. Yes. Um, Japan Absolutely. has is the most trusted country in South and Southeast Asia. Japan can say things about China. Japanese governments can without putting their relationships with Southeast Asia at risk. Australia is in a somewhat different position. So that, you're right. It is going to be. Uh, we're not going to be able to have the same discourse uh, on this, are we? I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and Korea, which also is heavily dependent on. Well, well we'll talk so, about more than Korea. Right. But. So that's. So so there are two points. The first is, uh, uh, of course, Japan can speak about China because for the reasons you've said, structurally they're big. We've talked about China for a long time. I think the situation is changing dramatically in Korea today. Mm -hmm. I mean, in one, one, because the public, China is now the most disliked country in Korea, more, more so than, uh, than Japan. Um, uh, and second, uh, change in leadership, right? If we look at the joint statement that came out last week, uh, there is language in there on China that we have not seen before. Um, talk, not just talking about the Taiwan Straits, but uh, militarization of islands, South China Sea. There's a lot of things in there that, that are new. But I want to go back to the point um, you know, about how other countries besides the United States and Japan have to soft pedal how they talk about China because 40% of their trade is with China or, or in South Korea's case, they, China's their number one trading partner. I mean, these facts are all true, but um, so as you may know, I've been doing some work on countering Chinese economic coercion, and the core of it is that, yes, we are all asymmetrically dependent on China for trade, but asymmetrical interdependence works two ways. Um, and that there are many things that China depends on with regard to Australia, Japan, and other countries, that if we pull together at a, as a lattice work, or whatever term you want to use, uh, and signal uh, collective economic deterrence messages uh, that continuing economic coercion will be costly for China, um, uh, there is, um, you know, there, there's potential there to shape behavior. Why, why do we not want to say the word China? Be, we're not worried that if we say the word China, they're going to attack us or attack Taiwan. We worry that they're economically going to coerce us, right? And so, so I've got a, I had a piece in Foreign Affairs, I have a piece coming out this summer in International Security that pulls together this data. Let me just give you one example, which is, if you look at um, G7 countries plus Australia, and I put Australia in the category because they have demonstrated, you know, uh, uh, an ability, a capacity, and a, and a willingness to counter Chinese economic coercion like no other country in the world. Um, if you put together G7 and Australia, there are over 400 items that they export to China that China is more than 70% dependent on as a percentage of trade in that particular good. Over 400 items. Some of these are not important, like ballpoint pens, but some of them are important, like the Japanese export of silver powder to China is critical for their making solar panels. And uh, China is dependent on Japan for like over 80% of their imports. And the next country, I think, is either Australia or the United States. So, and there are many, many other examples of, of this. There are over 160 items for G7 plus Australia countries um, that uh, over 160 items that China is 90% dependent on in terms of their imports of those particular goods. So um, um, Australia and the US on nickel powders used for rechargeable batteries. China is 83% dependent on Australia and the United States as, as, uh, as import sources for that. So the point of all this is not to advocate starting a trade war, obviously, but deterrence is all about signaling and resolve. Um, and if you use this lattice work, 
not just for security deterrence, but also for economic deterrence. I just think there's potential there. That's dissuasion. I mean, that's uh, deterrence, mm. dissuasion, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Um, it's also hard. No, it's very <laughs> for, it's, it's, um, it's hard yeah. for OECD countries to order uh, order this. Uh, no, I, I, it's hard, and um, so in terms of sort of WTO conformity, so I've talked to folks who know WTO and things like that, and they say that if it's framed as a collective economic deterrence threat reciprocal to a Chinese act of coercion, it may not be in violation of WTO norms. Um, I picked G7 plus, plus Australia because these are all um, like-minded countries. They're medium to large economies, so they're not e as easily picked off by, by China. Uh, and they've all been victims of Chinese economic coercion, right? All of them yeah. have suffered the same experience. And this is not to say resilience building, impact mitigation, like what we're doing for Lithuania, um, trade diversification, what Australia has done very successfully. It's not to say these things don't matter. They do matter. But they will not stop the next act of Chinese economic coercion. So we need to find something else. And as a first order point, these are reasons why countries should follow Australia's example and not self-deter. Absolutely. The, the, the balance of power and influence self is much more. Self-deter and self-censor. Self-censor yeah. and self-censor. So, um, especially the resources point. Can yes. you fund the strategy you wrote if you have to say it's about a country that starts with CNN's with A without saying the country or without describing? I'm talking about, yeah. I mean, no, you obviously were quite um, analytical and, and precise in the work, but the government now selling it to the public. Can they sell it without talking about the threat? Oh, look, they absolutely have to talk about the threat. And what's interesting um, with the DSR, like the, what I put out in my initial remarks is basically paraphrasing or quoting from the document itself. It's very clear about strategic competition. It's very clear about Chinese military expansion, coercive tactics and all that stuff. But it just, then it doesn't labour the point. It gets on and makes, well, once you make, a, have that assumption, assume that, accept that, then what are you going to do about that? And for, for one of the big changes in the DSR was it's moving Australian defence and strategic planning into a net assessment approach, which is then identifying what that key threat is, and the document did that, and then organising and focusing your force and your resources mm -hmm. around that. Um, and it's interesting, the document got whacked by a whole bunch of people for not talking about China enough. It got whacked by a whole bunch of other people that it was all about China and it shouldn't be about China. And I think if you're getting hit from both sides, it probably landed somewhere in the middle pretty much about right. Yeah, exactly. and, and the other point I'd make about it, the document makes a really big emphasis on the rediscovery of Australian statecraft. That is, you know, defence and foreign affairs working together, but also broader parts of government. You know, trade, economics, everything, working in unison and pulling towards a, a fundamental defining point, which Penny Wong laid out in her speech before the DSR, but it's in the language of the DSR, which is, it's about maintaining a favourable balance of power in the region to ensure a certain sovereignty. And to paraphrase Penny Wong, she's been really good on this, is what she says when we talk about China is we cooperate where we can, we disagree where we must, but we always ensure Australian sovereignty and we always preserve Australian interests. And that's how you do it with, with that particular problem. And in some areas, to effectively do Australian statecraft, and the document I think reflects this, um, there's no point labouring the China point and, and using megaphone diplomacy. But the document states it and analyses it and moves on to a solution part. Statecraft is not then using a megaphone down the back end of the document to, to, to overlay your point. But also China um, can be wrapped up too much in being too much of a focus to pursue our interests. So in the South Pacific, for instance, and the document talks about climate change being really critical as a security issue. The South Pacific countries want to talk about climate change. For too long, we wanted to turn up into the region and talk about China. They wanted to talk about climate change. And, you know, the Biden administration, the Albanese administration have made climate change a new pillar in the alliance. It's been incredibly effective now in Australian statecraft and US statecraft in the South Pacific. And we're talking on terms that we can outcompete China on, on terms where we've got a better narrative to sell than they do, that we can make progressive moves with that. And that's where we also got to look, you know, to compete differently and to compete on our terms and stuff. So I think that's really important. But in the debate in Australia, you know, there's, there's been a bunch of books written, you know, lately saying we're overeating the China problem. There's been other people saying we're not doing um, enough. But if you go back to public opinion polls, the Australian population gets this. 
You know, if you look at polls back in the early 2010s, and they were asked, is, Australia, is China more of a trading partner or a security threat? Well, it was trading partner, security threat. Now, move forward about five or six years, and that had absolutely flipped the other way around. The Australian public sees it a security threat and a trading partner. So the public's really aware of what's happening. They're informed. And I think it's about cr creating that nuanced balance where you, you talk about the threat, you organise around the, the threat and the concerns that you have, but don't overlabor the point and don't make it only about that. Yeah, I mean, it, depending on how the question is asked, when you look at these surveys in Australia, but also Korea and Japan, the US, UK, Canada, very much the same. Yeah. Um, but uh, even if the threat part's getting higher, the economic partner piece is substantial. Yes. And too much of the debate has been a binary. It's one yes, or the other. And so the art absolutely. of what Penny Wong's speech did artfully and more of this is needed to say it's, it is both. Yes, it's and you both. Need, you it's need funny. to deal with both. Let me open it up for some comments and questions from the floor if you'd like. Um, otherwise, I have more for the panel. We have some microphones. You can put your hand up um, and just ask that you be brief because we're running up on the clock. While they're yeah. thinking, the, you know, the, on the other aspect, though, is that, and this is really for the next panel, economic security is changing the, mm. the, the trade patterns, right? Yep. I mean, look at the Korea case. Korea, in the Korea case, last year was the first year where China was not the number one trading partner for Korea since 1998, right? The United States was. Right, because of all the, the decline in semiconductor export. So it's the, the trade picture is also changing as well. And, and the other piece, which a lot of people in this audience would know, but it's important, is FDI. Yeah, right. that's, uh, that's exactly where I was going to go. Foreign direct investment's uh, key. Not a Sinocentric story. It's, yes, it's, 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 it's particularly for the US, Australia, Korea, and the US. Absolutely. So, absolutely. so any um, observations, questions, comments from the floor? Um, yes, right there, thank you. <coughs> Tom Parker, George Washington University. Would any of the panelists like to comment on uh, whether the various claimants to the South China Sea are basically happy, and I'll include Australia too, happy with US policy or, or not so happy? On the South China Sea. On the South China Sea, right. So um, the claimants plus Australia. You well, want to start? I, I think Australia has been incredibly um, consistent with its, uh, with its approach to the South China Sea. We're, we're not a claimant. We have interests in the South China Sea, and we've had a very long-term presence in the South China Sea. So we've been you know, subject to uh, some really dangerous activity by Chinese military against our aircraft and ships in the South China Sea, trying to push back on it. But the Australian position is, well, we've been doing this since the 1950s. We haven't changed our presence and our posture. We're providing a positive, net positive security good within that region. Um, and it's about supporting, you know, the, the legal claims position, supporting what the, the UN and UNCLOS position is, and maintaining consistency with our allies and partners on that. Now, there was, for a long time period, there was discussion about FONOPS and these other things. The Australian government, you know, kept its position very um, consistent, and I think it's proven to actually be a, a really solid, long-standing position that makes it really clear what Australia's position is regarding the so-called rules-based international order, if that's the term you'd like to use, but also with our partnerships and friendships and relationships with the other claimants within the state. So it's not preferencing anyone against the other because, you know, many of those claims overlap, not just between China's view of the region, but actually between the different states in, in ASEAN. So I think that's a very, what I would say is we've been very consistent in that approach and I can't see that changing. It's a very consistent way we've done it. I think it's probably fair to say that the claimants in the South China Sea, Australia, and Japan, are not happy. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, uh, the, the PLA has uh, def defined, def in spite of Xi Jinping's promise to President Obama, the PLA has militarized its artificial Absolutely. airfields and has established um, tactical air dominance over everybody in the region. Um, the bases are about. 10 times the size of US aircraft carrier. I mean, these, if, you, if you see mock-ups of them, it looks like, An like Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. It's bigger than um, Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. These are massive military facilities. Nobody's happy about that, except the PLA. Um, that's why President Marcos is here and has agreed to upgrade EDCA. It, it's why um, Australia, I'm sure this is part of the review. I mean, if you're in Australia, the thought of having to the US or Australia having to fight its way through the South China Sea. That last time we were there, it was not good. 
<laughs> well, and, um, and it puts the northern part of Australia at risk because of the capabilities that China's forward deploying in there that it's extending its range. I mean, it's a negative impact on the security environment. Or if you're Japan with over half of your trade going through the South China Sea. So, not happy. Um, are we perfectly on the same page on this? No. But I think, um, I think there is far greater alignment. President Marcos' visit really yep. demonstrates that, the Defense Strategic Review, Japan's growing presence um, in the South China Sea, um, operating with Australia. Uh, uh, so, um, and India, which has to worry about the Indian Ocean next. Um, th th you know, on the diplomacy of it, we're not, we're all struggling because the plan was um, we'd use ASEAN centrality and multilateralism to put pressure on China to negotiate in good, in good faith. And when the International Tribunal decided um, against China and for the Philippines, China picked up its toys and wouldn't play anymore. And so uh, the diplomatic answer is tough to understand right now, but the mm. geopolitical implications, people aren't happy. But I think that you're seeing not perfect, but more alignment. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add in one thing, uh, fully underscoring uh, the point that no one is happy I with how no things happy. have progressed. Uh, but no one's happy both because what China has done and because we haven't been able I would say, much like for a long time, our response to economic coercion, it was really hard to figure out how to counter what China was doing. And then it became even harder when the Philippines decided that it was no longer willing to prosecute the case, right, from a number of different angles. And uh, I would just underscore that things are changing now. No one is happy still, but if we think about the way that we are prosecuting the case, Philippines is back on side, is publicizing what China is doing. American force posture is rapidly shifting in the region and becoming stronger, and we are pursuing beefed up asymmetric capabilities. Uh, so I would say that it's a changing picture of what the reaction is, and it looks remarkably different than it did even two years ago, even as we are still unhappy with what the picture looks like. Can I just, yeah. so, um, I, I agree with what's been said. Um, the, I just want to make two points. The first is, the other, the, are, are they completely happy with the way the United States talks about China and the region and the way it's sort of focused its diplomacy, coalitional diplomacy on China? You know, perhaps not. The flip to the question is, are the claimants in the South China Sea happy with the way China's behaving? Right, in terms of militarization of the region and in terms of you know, the arbitrary and unspoken, unseen use of economic coercion against all of the countries, all of the claimants to the South China Sea. I would argue that they're more upset with that and concerned about that than they are about the language the United States uses. But I will say that I do think that, and you guys can tell me if this is right or wrong, I do sense that um, ASEAN centrality is, sort of becoming a moniker uh, that has sort of superficially been on top of all of this effort by, led by the United States to try to push the coalitions in the direction of focusing on the China problem. And there's probably some resentment in that respect that ASEAN centrality isn't as central as it used to be uh, when we talk about Yeah, uh, well, what part of Beijing's um, sometimes pretty effective narrative against AUKUS and the Quad is that it undermines ASEAN centrality, which is rich yeah. when you consider that they can destroy ASEAN yeah, centrality, centrality by rejecting the tribunal decision. But it's, it resonates because, as Mia said, often these narratives touch on sort of you know deep historical memory of colonial experiences and things. Well, I mean, in yeah, the, oh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to add. I think it, it's also another um, example of how this issue has been brought into the wider public consciousness because when you start to think about things like undersea cables and global information flows which are often owned by large tech companies, you know, the, the issues with the fishing um, boats and the, and the militias, it, you really start to see this becoming a, a much broader, more public issue to your point which does then, um, you know, does shape the other, the other claimants and nations in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we can do one more quick one, uh, Jada. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Jada Frazier. I'm currently a graduate student at Georgetown University. I wanted to bring um, our European partners and allies into the conversation. So do um, we. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, recently we've had some historic firsts with Japan and South Korea both attending NATO summits. I think just a couple days ago there was recent news that NATO has set up an office in Japan. Um, my question for anyone on the panel that, that wants to take it is, 
what is the staying power of these new relations? Is this something that we're just primarily seeing um, as a consequence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Um, how long are these, are these dynamics going to continue to shape the region? And then how do they contribute to accomplishing the three objectives that Dr. Adele um, identified? Why don't you start, off on, start us off, Charlie, on, on, on the Europe card? Yeah, um, great question, uh, Jada. Um, how, I, I think you asked, what's the staying power of these dynamics where the Europeans are increasingly interested in security in uh, the Indo-Pacific and several nations, several big nations in the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, fly to Madrid, fly to Vilnius. Um, and uh, I would say that the driving answer to that is uh, great efforts by the U.S. administration so far, great efforts by Canberra, Tokyo, Seoul, um, greater efforts by Beijing. They are our number one ally, and they continue to be, and they continue to be the prompt that has tightened all of this lattice work, this networks, these partnerships that we're talking about. So while that continues, be it with the New Limits Partnership, uh, be it with the potential to supply and be Russia's best friend, be it with aggression around the region, be it with the move into markets in Europe, be it uh, with kind of crowding out emerging tech and subsuming it to their own, I think that demand signal will remain. Now, if uh, Chinese statecraft became either um, uh, more supple, um, less intrusive, or less aggressive, I think that prompt would fade. But I see no signs of that happening anytime soon. Anyone else want to touch on this before we finish? Yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll just say that um, so I certainly, I certainly agree with that. The, um, uh, but I would say it's, it's the security theaters become connected not necessarily just because there's a war in Europe or just because of the threat in the Taiwan Straits. Personally, I don't think China will attack Taiwan by 2027. But I do know for a fact by 2027, China will have economically coerced many countries. Right, in, in, in Europe and in Asia. And that is, I think, the demand signal mm. that brings yes. a lot of these folks together. Yeah, I, look, one of the other things is we've got to remember, you know, France is an Indo-Pacific power, for instance. You know, many of these states have real key interests in the Indo-Pacific world, but I totally agree on, if you look on a, on a harder power measure, are we going to maybe have a NATO office and, and do a few other things? Our Prime Minister has been invited to go to the NATO summit and particularly talk about the economic coercion piece that Australia's resisted and pushed back on. If you go to the real hard power stuff, in the event of a conflict, I don't think it's going to go that power. I don't expect, like, you know, that wouldn't expect Australians to be fighting in Europe against Ukraine, vice versa. But I think on the economic piece, on the connectivity between the two regions is really key. And from an Australian perspective, for instance, you know, th there was a really deliberate decision by the government to send Stephen Smith, who was one of the reviewers of the independent leads of the Defence Strategic Review, to London. Because it's about, like, the, the review is very focused on the Indo-Pacific. Really narrows down from a strategic military point of view the tightness of our region. You've seen our foreign minister very, very focused on being in the South Pacific. And, and uh, she's been to every single state in the South Pacific now and Southeast Asia. But there's a reason Stephen's in London. And that is because there's a connectivity between those two regions, particularly on trade, particularly on trade coercion. And, and diplomatic relations as well. And I think that's the, that's the hub that's drawing it together. There's the old Henry Kissinger line, when you want to talk to Europe, who do you call? And um, uh, there are different narratives, perspectives, diplomatic strategies with China, and they're changing. They're very personality dependent. Um, Macron right now is profoundly unhelpful to the US, Japan, Australia, and Europe. Um, but I don't think, anecdotally at least, that's where the Cato say of the Foreign Office, certainly the Defense Ministry are on China. Um, the German foreign minister happens to be quite focused on China as a problem, and that's quite, uh, quite a powerful um, uh, input into the European debate. So it's not clean, but, but the polls show the, um, the NATO strategic concept, the, the AP4, the four US allies in Asia joining the NATO summit, the trend lines are, um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping may have thought he had Europe a few years ago, but he's losing it. Uh, has he lost it? No, no. But the, but it's if, if if I were in the Chinese foreign ministry, I'd be worried about 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 that. It, which I'd concluded because underlying all of these discussions we have about our alliances and the increasing alignment is this can't be good for Chinese foreign policy. It just can't be good. And one wonders who in Zhongnanhai is telling this to Xi Jinping 
Is there a feedback loop, or does is there a conclusion that doesn't matter? Because they'll just move faster and stronger and harder than any of us can. It's a really good question, but we're out of time. So um, <laughs> we'll leave that to Jude Blanchett and the China experts at CSIS. Nick, are we taking a go outside break or just repositioning? So a quick five minute break so we can get Matt Goodman in the next panel up here on economic security. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I think the first panel solved some things, but not the important things, which are uh, the economic stuff. We're always last but best, so stay tuned for that. Uh, actually, I must say, increasingly I'm finding that I'm getting invited to conferences in which economics comes first, which is very disorienting um, these days, but I guess it's a sign of the time. So, um, but we're delighted uh, to be back for this uh, second panel on hot topic of the day, economic security. Um, and uh, we have a terrific panel up here. In fact, I, I said at an um, event the other day that there are two types of panels at CSAS. They're analog panels and they're chat GPT panels. Uh, with a chat GPT one, you just put in a question and you get five perfectly honed paragraphs um, on whatever topic you're interested in. And this is, uh, this is that kind of panel, although there's nothing artificial about any of the intelligence up here. Um, <laughs> We're going to talk about this, this hot topic, economic security, that nobody quite has defined properly. And if you have defined it, you probably have a different definition from everybody else because, uh, because there, there's still a sort of global debate about this subject. And I hope we're going to get at least five different opinions today about what it means. Uh, but you'll then be able to choose uh, your favorite version. Um, you're going to get a lot of acronyms uh, here, IRA, CHIPS. Um, IPEF, CPTPP, BRI, and I would um, ask the panelists, whoever's the first person to use one of those acronyms, please spell it out so that I can save my breath. Um, but we should, we should help folks uh, get through all of that. But you know, economic security has, um, I think at the core, I think we all kind of understand it has something to do with making our economies more resilient to various uh, risks and threats. Uh, but exactly what that means and how far it goes is, is a, a very big question. So I hope we're going to get into some of those issues. Again, terrific panel here, and I'm going to let them do most of the work here. So uh, just going down the line here to my immediate left is Dr. John Kunkel, who is Senior Economic Advisor um, with the Economic Security Program at the U.S. Uh, States uh, Study Center in, at the University of Sydney, um, our partners for this uh, event. Uh, he's an economist, he's a, an advisor to government, he's been an industry um, executive. Most recently he was chief of staff to uh, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Uh, and he actually has a PhD in economics, so we've got a real economist up here, which is terrific. So delighted to have John with us. Uh, next is Emily Benson, our colleague uh, who is director of the Project on Trade and Technology here at CSAS. She's also a senior fellow in the uh, Scholl Chair with the Scholl Chair in International Business. Um, she focuses on trade, investment, technology issues, especially in a transatlantic context, although she can go global as well. Um, uh, she worked in a European foundation on some of these issues before. She's worked at the um, EU delegation to the United States, and, and we're delighted to have Emily with us as well. Um, Haley Channer, next to her, is uh, Director of the Economic Security Program with the uh, U.S. Studies Center at University of Sydney. Um, Haley uh, was with the Perth USA Center before this. Um, she's done analysis on China's Belt and Road Initiative. There we go, BRI, I did the first one. Um, infrastructure investment in the Indo-Pacific, um, multilateral economic frameworks. Uh, she's provided policy guidance to both Australian and US um, uh, government officials. Uh, she was also a Fulbright here last year in DC and we were delighted to have her in the neighborhood. Um, so uh, delighted to have Haley with us. And then last but not least is my colleague, uh, Gerard DePippo. He is senior fellow with our economics program. Uh, and he uh, was previously, he's been with us about 18 months, getting on for two years now, I think. Uh, he was uh, 11 years in the US intelligence community. Uh, he was uh, most significantly the uh, senior economic analyst on East Asia, which really means China, but I guess they're not allowed to say that. It's China. Um, yeah. It's China, <laughs> okay. So, um, and uh, Gerard has done a lot of terrific work on what I think we can, you'll see, uh, define as economic security, but sanctions and, and uh, uh, also issues around uh, digital dollar and so forth. So uh, terrific to have Gerard with us as well. Did I actually say who I was? I don't think I did at the beginning. <laughs> okay, no. I'm sorry. I'm Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President. I direct the economics program here at CSAS. Delighted to be doing this with my old friend and colleague, um, Mike Green, and, and uh, other colleagues from U.S. Studies Center. So uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go not down the line. I'm actually going to start with Haley. Um, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to ask sort of a similar question to everyone, which is um, what is economic security? Matt, great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So um, thank you very much for having me here. And just a quick 
personal note that this is a real privilege for me to be here because um, I come from what I call the Miami of Australia, it's the Gold Coast, and um, being able to be up on this stage at CSIS is the realisation of many, many years of hard work. So um, I direct the Economic Security Program at the US Studies Centre, and economic security is a new term, and I want to explain what it means from an Australian context. So for us, economic security means around four things. The first is freedom from economic coercion from China. The second one is secure supply chains. The next one is being able to pay for national security. And then the fourth one is a US-led regional trade architecture in the Indo-Pacific. Now, just on the first one, economic coercion, many people here will know that Australia faced a lot of economic coercion in the last couple of years. Um, it all started when Australia decided back in 2018 that it didn't want a Chinese telecommunications company to supply our 5G network. And in response, China banned everything from beef to barley, cotton to coal, and gas, uh, and other, a whole list of other things. And actually, only just recently, we have um, come to an agreement with China on lifting the barley ban, uh, the ban on barley. Um, and that really happened because last year we had a change in government which really changed the tone of a relationship with China. But more than that, China didn't want to be embarrassed after the World Trade Organization would find in Australia's favor over that uh, issue on Bali. So that's really well known. The other issue on, of economic security is on supply chains. And in terms of how Australia has you know, responded to supply chain issue, we are one of the worst countries for diversified trade. Um, we are the 13th largest economy by GDP globally, but we rank 82 out of 131 countries for economic diversity. I mean, how terrible is that? Um, so we really need to improve that. Um, and then the third thing in terms of um, economic security is just paying for national security goods. And this is gonna be a huge challenge for Australia and Australians for decades. Um, Economic security means something totally different to Australians. Uh, Australians are just worried about how they're going to be able to buy their first home. They're also worried about how we're going to pay for our ageing population, which is a concern in Japan as well. And also we have a national disability insurance scheme, which is costing us millions upon millions. The other thing we have is that uh, it's a real problem around how we're going to service our national debt. Obviously, that's an issue for the US as well. Um, so I think the last thing on actually paying for national security, AUKUS is going to cost us a lot of money. Uh, it's going to cost us perhaps up to $368 billion. That figure doesn't really sound huge in a US context, but for Australia, it's going to be our largest single defence expenditure in our history. So it's a lot of money for us. And it's not just that we don't like paying more for defence, something that we've had from the US for many decades. Um, it's because we've also got these other domestic funding priorities and we're coming off the back of a global pandemic. But we're not only worried about picking up the check for AUKUS, actually psychologically there is an impact on Australians in terms of paying more for defence. By taking money out of our pockets to pay for something, we are acknowledging that in future we might have to fight war with China. And psychologically, that is just not something that a lot of Australians want to think about. Um, but I also think this kind of clash of economics and security is something that governments are really going to have to grapple with more and more these days, more than they have in the past. It wasn't long ago that we weren't thinking about economic security from China. We were just thinking about China's military threat. And when I think back to um, my background, which is as a Defence Department official, I joined defence because I was interested in strategy. People join treasury or commerce because they're interested in finance. People join the State Department or our Foreign Affairs Department because they're interested in diplomacy. In future, we are going to need people that know about all of those things together. And that's going to be a lot harder to recruit for into our different government departments. But it's also going to be very hard to skill for that um, ability, for people to work across defence, um, trade and also foreign affairs. So we really need that skill set. Um, and I think finally in the last couple of years we have really turned a page on this issue. 
And there's no better indication that there's a new chapter of economic security than the Biden administration's policies, including the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, the Chips and Science Act, and other export control measures. And what I think we're seeing at the moment is that things are moving so fast and we're all just trying to understand what's happening and we're probably implementing a lot of economic policy on the run. Um, and then we're trying to fix that policy after the fact. So I think what we need to do is slow down a little bit before we actually do things and think about some of the unintended negative consequences it could have for allies and partners. Uh, the final thing I want to talk about is IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and that's the fourth area of what I consider to be economic security. And that's having a US engaged uh, on trade and economics in the Indo-Pacific region. Right now, the US, the largest economy in the world, um, a country that has six out of its ten top trade partners in Asia, doesn't have a multilateral economic framework in Asia. China is in RCEP. Um, and we also have the CPTPP, so that's the Regional Economic Comprehensive uh, mm -hmm. Partnership and then the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Nice. Um, nice, nice. But now we have the new IPEF and um, I just want to make a couple of comments about IPEF. Um, what is IPEF? Well, I know there's a lot of lacklustre enthusiasm for it. Um, I don't want to overstep my mark here, um, Matt, but if I was to guess where the clubhouse for the lacklustre enthusiasm might be, it could be your office here at CSIS. <laughs> um, <Ooh. laughs> but uh, you'll, find a lot <laughs> you'll find a lot more enthusiasm in Canberra, Tokyo, Singapore, Hanoi, and Wellington. Um, right now, IPEF is hard to explain because it doesn't have a bumper sticker. It's a bit like the quad. No one really knows what it's about. Right now, IPEF is an agreement to negotiate an agreement. Because the US can't do a traditional free trade agreement, it is doing everything else that it can do. So although there's no beef in the sandwich, um, there's no greater, US, um, greater access into US markets and no lower tariffs, it's got everything else. It's got digital trade, supply chains, climate security, and also anti-corruption and tax. So it's doing everything it possibly can in all the other areas. Um, I think there are four things uh, IPEF needs to do to be a success, and that's where I'll finish my comments. The first one is that it either needs to lower its ambitions in places like labour and environment, or it needs to create an on-ramp for countries so that, so that they can dial up their uh, uh, commitment to some of the regulations. The second thing is that the developed countries in IPEF need to provide carrots to the developing countries because there is no other carrot of greater market access into the US. So for example, Thailand's not going to implement US MCA style labor standards, that's the US Mexico Canada agreement, um, without technical assistance. And Southeast Asian nations generally shouldn't do a digital trade agreement unless they have the infrastructure in place and cyber security. Uh, thirdly, like many deals, it could benefit from the junior parties feeling like they've got power over the big dog at the table. President Biden just needs to pick up the phone, call his counterparts in Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines and put his personal star power behind this agreement so that people know in the region he is personally committed to it. And lastly, IPEF needs to be done by November okay. APEC. There is a real time limit to this because next year we're going to be heading into a US election year. And while I'm not concerned about a Trump or uh, another Republican candidate crushing this agreement, I am concerned about attention being lost. So we need, really need to land it by November. OK, excellent. And, um despite the dig at me on IPEF, which I now have to respond to, I, um, you got all the acronyms except AUKUS, but I assume that the last, uh, the last gang did that, so you get points for all that. Okay, John, let's get another Australian perspective. Okay. What is economic security? Um, well, first, my name's John. I'm a recovering free trade economist working on industrial policy. Um, and look, as well as working with Haley on the, the economic security program. I, I have a somewhat different take. I agree with some things Haley said. Um, but not all of them, 
So I start sort of looking at it historically, and I'm also conscious that Jake Sullivan gave a, a pretty comprehensive new take on what economic security means down the road last week. But if I look historically, Australia did extraordinarily well out of the old Washington consensus of the early 1990s. We basically set a record internationally by going 29 years without a recession prior to the pandemic. Um, a point I, I'll make again, Australians got a huge pay rise out of the industrialisation of China. So the China challenge is looked at differently in Australia. Now, a lot's happened in the last five years to change that, but the historical backdrop is very important in understanding that basically our economic security thinking was bound up with the old Washington consensus. We're now at the foothills of trying to find something and craft something different for a new age. It's a fascinating time. It's really challenging, I think. It's challenging everyone's intellectual frameworks. I reread Jake's speech again today. It actually is worth reading and rereading a lot because it does challenge you, challenge people like me who've got a, a background in economics, in free trade. I disagree with some of the way he's framed this quite profoundly, but I think he's done a great service, actually, and, and I hope people in Australia are reading it. Because it's challenging us all to think about what economists actually do know about, which is that there are always trade-offs. So I actually put that alongside the important point that Janet Yellen um, put in her speech the other day, where she basically said, yeah, we're doing this for national security reasons, and if we need to pay an economic cost, we will. Um, going to the points that were made in the earlier session, we're a long way from an Australian government saying that to the Australian people, in part because of that historical success that we've had in an old model. So I guess the first point I want to make really is going to Pete's earlier presentation, is we basically, if you think of our national strategy as a three-legged stool, We've basically re renovated defence and national security. We've renovated diplomacy, and under Penny Wong, we've got you know, a very powerful and strategic foreign minister. So those two legs of the stools have been refashioned by both sides of politics over about five years, quite profoundly. The economic statecraft stool is where we're totally at the foothills of rethinking what that now looks like. Um, and that's, you know, frankly, that's the project that, that Haley and I, I think, uh, are looking to work on together within the context of the alliance. And there'll be some things where we uh, agree, we can cooperate, we can take advantage of it and work together. There'll be other things where it's a bit harder because we have a different set of economic interests and we have to sort of acknowledge that. Um, so it's a fascinating time for, a, for an old economist. I actually started uh, as a, a full brother down at what was the old Institute for International Economics and I visited there the other day and it was like a trip down the time tunnel. I mean, it was, it was a different Washington um, and a different Washington consensus then in, of the, the mid-1990s. Um, so I think, I think the, I guess the other point I'll make is Economic security, I think economic resilience is in some ways a better term because the foundations of it, and it goes back to my earlier point, why did Australia succeed through that period of China economic coercion? I'd like to say it was because Scott Morrison had a brilliant cast of advisers <laughs> on the policy front, and I will say that, of course. But the reality is we succeeded because we had a flexible market-based economy. So it's very important that I think in our discussions, including in the United States, we sort of have to have a little bit of a corrective about state-driven. Now, I'm a, I'm a conservative who believes deeply in the need for state capacity, but we have to have a sense of what are the limits of state-driven economic policy as well. And I, again, I sort of think, um, I think Jake's actually laid out the challenge pretty well because this is the way democracies learn and we'll disagree and hopefully we'll come to a framework that is not first best. It's not going to be first best. 
but it might be a respectable third best that deals with the security challenges we have. Excellent. Okay. Well, there's a lot also uh, to dig uh, more deeply in there, and um, and I um, want to explore a little more the the Jake Sullivan and Yellen speeches. But let us um, go to Emily next. Emily, can you give an American perspective or your personal perspective on this issue? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And um, I want to echo Haley in thanking uh, everyone here for the invitation to participate. It's um, a great opportunity to learn more about Australia. I think first and foremost. It depends who you ask, right? We tend to ascribe uh, these buzzwords to having a single definition, and I think that's important to keep in mind, uh, that the definition really depends on the vantage point. Uh, I was hoping Gerard would have written a commentary on what is economic security, but since he hasn't yet, I hope he does soon. I will also uh, lean on the Jake Sullivan speech from last week, which I think does a really fantastic job. Uh, and to add just a little bit of color of the real content of the speech, my favorite analogy that he used was in saying that we're moving away from a Parthenon-style global economic order, the post-World War II Washington consensus, towards a new Frank Gehry style of international architecture. And if you're familiar with Frank Gehry, it's these really outlandish kind of ribbons of steel and aluminum that uh, cover the Disney Museum in LA, for example, or the, the museum in Bilbao. Uh, what's kind of a cool coincidence is that he has a new museum opening in 2025 in Abu Dhabi. And the theme, he literally designed the theme around moving from messy into clarity. And I think what Jake Sullivan was really trying to capture is that we're building a new economic order, a new system that more accu accurately reflects the messiness of how the world really works. And I think what he's also saying is that it will remain messy uh, for the foreseeable future, but that the goal is to move further and further into a period of clarity. Uh, what makes it messy? To go back to the acronyms, we have uh, the IPUF, obviously. We also have a series of critical mineral arrangements that the U.S. is negotiating with Japan, probably Indonesia, potentially others, of course, the European Union. We also have the GASA, which I think is potentially the worst trade acronym ever. The <laughs> Global spell that Arrangement out. <laughs> on Sustainable Steel and Aluminum, which he referenced uh, repeatedly in the speech last week. But that is a sectoral arrangement. It's bilateral with the European Union. It's sort of a three-for-one policy where the EU gets a tariff reduction. Uh, they also get their decarbonization agenda accelerated. And the United States has a tariff plan for combating overcapacity from China. So there's a lot there. It's a very creative trade tool. Uh, but negotiations aren't going well. Uh, we're sort of at an impasse with the European Union. And I think that's potentially problematic for the administration's agenda because if we're hanging our coat on this real sterling succeeding example of the future of trade, but talks are not on schedule, or we probably will blow through the October deadline that's been established, uh, then I think there's a little bit more room for skepticism uh, in the new approach. But overall, I would say that the sentiment in Washington is that we're moving away from this attitude towards China as our biggest customer and towards our biggest threat. And the way that that's manifested is in this two-pronged approach, which is promote and then protect. And promote, obviously, is encapsulated in a lot of these industrial policies that we've seen here, whether it's the uh, $369 billion close to the AUKUS price tag uh, of the IRA or uh, the Chips and Science Act. If you look at some of the provisions of each of those that has garnered a lot of response from allies, it's really the China provisions. So if you look at the EV tax credit, for example, the core of that is on uh, focusing on moving supply chains and critical minerals away from China. If you look at chips and science or guardrails, it creates stipulations for companies to receive money um, based on a promise that they won't invest above a certain threshold in China for a 10-year period. Um, so we see that protect and promote. But I think if we go one level more granular, there are a couple of uh, sort of distinct policy features to the American ap approach to trade right now and then a couple of commonalities. So I know time is short, let me just run through them quickly. Um, I think the first big distinction is that economic security is really permeating everything and that's included in the industrial policy pursuits I just described. Another problem is about durability, and that's another real hole in the Jake Sullivan speech recently, is that the administration is assuming they have a long timeline. 
Uh, if we're talking about reorganizing the global economy and building a new consensus that's to be determined and we're doing a Frank Gehry style architecture, that takes a lot of time and they may not win the next election. And whoever comes next is very unlikely to subscribe to exactly this Frank Gehryization of international economics. Uh, so what does that mean? We don't know, but the durability problem will be a persistent one. And if there's a change in administration, I think a lot of these policies will get rolled back, uh, particularly on climate change. I think another big distinction between the Americans and allies is on the pursuit of quote unquote real trade deals. I know that Australia has been very effective at concluding formal FTAs, most notably with the UK. Uh, the United States is eschewing tariff liberalization and market access concessions. So that's another standalone point, especially with the European Union uh, as well. Another big sentiment, I think, in kind of a tweet-sized takeaway is that the business community, by and large, wants to do business in China, but they don't want to testify. And what that means is that CEOs are really restrained in their ability to go to Congress and persuade people in the legislative branch to produce good policy that would uh, keep intact some of the policies from the previous generation of policy making that have really benefited the US economy. Uh, so it's having a chilling effect on the quality of policy that's emanating from the legislative branch. A couple of commonalities with our, our allies in the approach is the uh, preference to de-risk rather than decouple. The, the administration for the past couple of years has gone to great lengths to say, oh, we absolutely do not want to fully decouple, but decoupling is inevitable in some high tech sectors like semiconductors or potentially quantum technology uh, moving forward. Another commonality is that for the US and allies alike, uh, costs will probably rise over time and efficiencies will decrease as we uh, infuse economic considerations with national security. And the last point I would make on commonality is that we are all facing a new reality. And I know this is something that came up in the last panel, but we are moving into multipolar territory. And it's not clear that we have yet designed the policies that will best uh, protect us as we move into this more complicated reality. Um, so let me leave it there and ask Great. You. Okay. A lot of terrific stuff to, to follow up on there, especially Frank Gehry, and I have a question <laughs> about that. Um, okay. Uh, Gerard, down to you. Well, uh, part of why I haven't written that commentary, maybe I should write it, is that I'm still struggling to define what economic security means. I think there is no consensus, uh, at least within the United States, um, and certainly not a consistent consensus across our allies. I think for the United States, um, the concept of economic security includes many things that are domestic. But on the international side, I would focus on de-risking, which really is focused on um, uh, resiliency efforts. My basic concern is that um, I think for the United States at least, I think we're trying to do too much with the concept of economic security, with too little discussion of the goals and risks that we're trying to address with it and with too few policy instruments and spending for the goals the U.S. is setting. There are, basic, there are two basic tensions. The first is how or if the U.S. can coordinate its policies with its allies. The second is the trade-offs between national security and economic objectives. I won't dwell on the first issue, but it's well known that you know, the IRA triggered blowback in Asia and Europe, and, and there's issues with coordination there. On the second issue, I'll just say that you know, there, there are trade-offs between economic security and prosperity. The Biden administration framed its strategy as capable of, of achieving many things at once, including revitalizing the middle class. What is missing, and this did not appear in Sullivan's speech, is a recognition that economic resiliency is often the opposite of economic efficiency. Despite all the talk about the uh, dashed or false hopes of trade and its effects on the United States and politics, I would argue, as uh, in part just to defend trade here, that the global financial crisis and its decade-long effects on aggregate demand and employment in the United States was a far, far bigger shock for the United States economy and polity than, quote, free trade was. Um, I do not think one can convincingly argue that trade liberalization, much less China itself, caused the global financial crisis. Financial liberalization, maybe. Um, in other words, I think the Biden administration is misdiagnosing the cause of the symptoms its policies are meant to address. The Biden administration is fixated on revitalizing the U.S. industrial base, which in general I think makes some sense, um, but less so when focused on job creation. U.S. manufacturing employment is currently 17, or sorry, in the 1990s before the China shock, it was 17 million. 
It is now 13 million, which sounds like a lot, but there are 156 million non-farm employees in the United States right now, so if you're doing the math, that's about 8%. The United States is a service economy, and we always will be. A far, far bigger constituency, although one that is less organized, is consumers. The American consumer has benefited for nearly 20 years of continuous flat or falling prices for manufacturing goods. If you look at U.S. price data, basically only services were going up until the global financial crisis. Those are non-traded, mind you, things like education or housing. They only experienced inflation starting in 2021. Now inflation is a major, perhaps the biggest economic issue in the United States, and yet we are pushing inflationary and very expensive policies in the name of economic security. So I think we need to acknowledge that resiliency often means moving production elsewhere at a higher cost, and insofar as it's done because of industrial policy, it means taxpayers are the ones paying for it. The U.S., uh, I, I liked your, your third comment about, you know, Australia needing to pay for things. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has functioned in a world of low interest rates and soft budget constraints for two or three decades at this point. I suspect that era might be ending. Trade-offs matter, and they're going to matter even more going forward. The Biden administration, in practice, if not rhetoric, is actually fairly narrowly targeting a few, albeit very expensive, sectors, like semiconductors, critical minerals, or high-capacity batteries. And perhaps these sectors are worth investing in or protecting or building more resiliency in. Um, those policies are not going to affect the entire U.S. economy, or certainly it won't affect the entire you know, U.S. consumer sector. And I am not suggesting that the current industrial policies um, are, uh, or even the China-related policies explain much of any of our current inflation problems. But true resiliency is not in the cards or in the budget. China's manufacturing sector is critical for more final and intermediate goods than the U.S. government can track, let alone address. I think localizing or, or friendizing, whatever you want to call it, those supply chains will take many years and is probably far beyond the currently approved subsidies. So in general, I wonder what kind of resiliency we're looking for and why. Uh, Sullivan in his speech talked about dependencies that could be exploited for, quote, economic or geopolitical leverage. He's talking about China, okay? Um, economic coercion, which you've mentioned, Haley, it, with China is a risk. Uh, thus far, it has not really been a major risk for the United States, as noted in our economic coercion report that the economics program put out a few, like a month or so ago. Uh, generally, the, the Chinese are quite reluctant to retaliate against the U.S. directly, but not so with Australia and, and other smaller economies. The thing is that China's primary coercive tools is import restrictions, not export restrictions. But the resiliency efforts are addressing the latter, not the former. So what, under, under what circumstances would China substantially or intentionally disrupt exports to the United States? In a narrative, you might say, oh, well, COVID. COVID shows that we need to worry about that. Um, if, I would actually argue what COVID really shows is the importance of trade, particularly with Asia. I think if the United States did not have a dynamic set of trading partners, including in China, which very rapidly got its factories back online, our supply issues would have been far, far worse. And in the United States, the bottlenecks were clearly primarily our own logistical issues at our ports, roads, truckers, elsewhere. That's not because of trade. Those are domestic issues. Uh, so my guess is the only really plausible scenario where the U.S. has to worry about massive export restrictions from, from China is in a major crisis, most likely a conflict. You already used the W word, war. Um, this is a valid concern. Uh, but the reality is that the risks that were um, so basically, we're not, I think we're not saying out loud the thing that we're really planning for, which is a severe but tail end risk. Because if you think that risk is not a risk, let's just say you thought there was a 0% chance of a war over Taiwan, for example, I suspect the justification for resiliency would be much, much lower. Um, and also, if that's the contingency we're planning for, we should probably consider all production that's moving from China to Southeast Asia, which a lot of it is. Um, as only marginally helpful for resiliency, because those areas will not be sheltered uh, during such a crisis. Uh, ultimately, I think we need to separate our lofty goals and talk about the post-neoliberal order uh, from the analysis of the specific policies or, or tools under discussion. And when it comes to resiliency, I think it's the actions of private firms, mostly irrespective of the uh, industrial policies themselves, that are really going to be driving the global architecture going forward. And the thing that is driving the, the global reassessment of supply chains in many multinational firms is geopolitical risks, including actions that Beijing is taking. So the world is changing. Uh, U.S. policy is only one small part of that, and I think we need to factor that in. Okay. Um, boy, there's a lot <laughs> there. And uh, um, 
I didn't choose the panel, so I just want to say, although I agree with everything Gerard said, it, just because he's in my program, that's not <laughs> why I agree with him. But I, um, and I agree with actually most of what everyone has said. I got to bite my tongue because there's a lot I want to say here. But can I just, since I asked everybody else what economic security is, I'm just going to play um, player manager here for one second, because um, you know I think there is probably such a thing as economic security, but but we do need to be careful about, about it. Um, I mean, I think we can all agree it does have something to do with promoting and protecting. So promoting, meaning we got to do a little bit more industrial policy. We got to invest more in our own strength. That's clearly seems like part of what this term means. Um, we need to protect. We, we've got things that are at risk and vulnerable and we need to, um, you know, through export controls, through strengthening supply chains, through better cybersecurity, we need to protect. Um, but there's one other thing that we also need to do, um, which is uphold and update the rules. I mean, and that part, at least in a lot of the conversation about these issues, doesn't get enough emphasis, which is, you know, that, and this is where I really, I diverge with Jake Sullivan in two ways. One, in his analysis, one is that he, um, he dismisses the role of trade as a, I mean, he blames it on sort of a lot of economic and social ills, when in fact it's a source of resilience and, um, and uh, economic security. Um, and um, it um, uh, is something that our partners want, so from a strategic point of view it's also very important, um, but we'll come back to that. Um, I, the other piece of, of Jake's analysis that I really think is problematic is, is the Frank Gehry point in a way. Um, which is that somehow this rules-based international order we created and championed for decades, you know, it worked for a while, but it's no longer relevant. And I just think that is fundamentally wrong. Frank Gehry's building is built on a foundation of concrete and steel or whatever it's got, right? It may be, it may be convoluted on top, but the foundation is there. And so, um, as it is, was in the Parthenon. So I think we still need the rules-based multilateral order as a floor, and I'm going to ask the panelists about this in a second. And whatever we build on top of that, I think we need to have that floor still uh, for a lot of reasons, which I can't elaborate on because otherwise I'll be the only one talking up here. Um, it's one other thing, though, about economic security, which worries me the term, which is the middle part of it, if I'm sort of a visual thinker, so I think of it as a spectrum of things between economics and security. And in the middle part, I think we can mostly agree, and then it's a question of tactics of how you apply supply chain resilience or export controls or whatever. It's where you get to the economic end of the term, I worry about it being used as an excuse for protectionism, or in fact, it is being used as such. <laughs> um, and at the other end, at the security end, it being used to sort of justify kind of weaponizing everything economic and um, potentially um, denying us the ability to get the prosperity that we all want and that provides the basis, as, as Haley importantly said, you know, it's the foundation of we got to pay for all this stuff. <laughs> so we got we to stay getting rich. We got to keep getting rich. Um, so um, so I, think, uh, I think that all has to be uh, borne in mind. And um, I guess one final thing, which is, and you can all react to all of this if you disagree with it, but I thought the Yellen approach was actually quite uh, powerful in many ways, including the fact that she started with national security, because what she said was, you know, I yield to no one in my concern about national security, mm. and we will do everything mm. to protect national security. But having done that, we then believe in openness and engagement and, you know, and, and um, free flows of everything, you know, trade, investment, data, whatever. And that's the way I think of it, and that's kind of a negative list approach, which is to say anything goes except the things that we have identified as off limits or that we are taking steps to mitigate a risk. And that's still, I think, the, the model we should use. The risks have grown, so I think that space has probably requires you know, more interventions and more uh, space, but, the, but we shouldn't forget that this openness and engagement is really important for a lot of reasons. So, okay, I've given my speech. Um, let me ask about the Frank Gehry thing. I mean, especially from an Australian perspective, um, how important is the multilateral rules-based order? Um, absolutely, question mark, question absolutely, mark. absolutely. To I a mean, small or medium, yeah. mid mid I mean, actually, you're big. I should huh. say, everybody always think they're small, but they're, you guys are the, you know, you're in the, you're in the top 20, and yeah. that makes, your big, that makes yeah. you big. <laughs> so. I mean, the basic arc of Australian history is 
we're a small country in terms of population. We jacked up protection um, because we wanted to build a larger pro population. We wanted to put that behind a manufacturing wall. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. Um, by, the, by 1980, our economic model was spent. And what did we have to do? We had to liberalise our economy. And we had to do it. We had to, I mean, basically, the old gap was the Americans and the Europeans and everyone else sort of just did whatever they want, pretty much. But the one thing, and I, again, I'll refer to this street again, uh, Max Corden, a famous Australian economist, was basically the key figure in, in recognising the economic costs of protection. And that was through our institutions, that was a process of learning where our policy elite basically came to a point of agreement that our economic model is spent, so we had to liberalise, and the rules are absolutely fundamental to the economic success of modern Australia. 29 years of continuous economic growth. So we get, we get trade, like we get trade. And that's bipartisan. So um, I think the real challenge has been nobody knows how to update the rules. That's really hard. So we've now gone basically 20 years without a functioning WTO, without a WTO round. I mean, our, the last WTO trade liberalisation was, I think there was a little bit in the late 90s. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. the part of the frustration and a sense that the failure, and, and that's not just China, that's India, that's a lot of countries, not being able to update the rules has meant that that's, in some sense, we're dealing with the offshoot of our failure to, to update the rules. And I think that's... You know, in a, I agree entirely, though, that, you know, I think the problem with Jake's speech was the downplaying of, of the, um, the economic importance of trade. Um, we got through the pandemic successfully because of trade. Not, not, you know, we didn't shut trade. Trade was the reason we got through the pandemic and got a, a good recovery. So some of it is... And, and funnily enough, I think the public actually... The public aren't the problem. It's, it's parts of the elite that are the problem in terms of getting an understanding of the importance of trade to success. Yeah, I mean, Mike often cites polls. You know, polls routinely show, you know, the Americans, Americans and probably Australians, it's even higher numbers, but, you know, support trade 65, 70 percent and rising. Um, and so that's true. There is a sort of disconnect that in Washington we don't seem to be having the same conversation that ordinary people are having. But and I guess, sorry, one other thing is... So if I, if I take, after reading Jake's speech, when an American official says a rule, free and open rules-based system, and I'll read that speech, yeah. something's got to give. Yeah. Um, by the way, I mean, I should have said, it's great that the National Security Advisor gave yeah. a speech about international <laughs> economics, and there was a lot of good stuff in there, so I don't mean to say it was all wrong, but there were some analytical points that I think were wrong. But Haley, you said that the, the WTO case that you filed against China um, played a part in their backing off on, on, um, on coercion, I think. Yeah, um, right. So it does seem to, even in that sense, have, have, a, have a power. Definitely, and I don't think we should give up on multilateral institutions. Um, Australia has a great uh, history of being a joiner. We love to join groups because we feel so isolated geographically down in the middle of the Pacific. And um, to go to an area of Emily's uh, expertise in terms of Europe and NATO, there is a NATO-sized hole in Australia's life in the Indo-Pacific. And that's why we've seen this proliferation of multilateral <coughs> groupings in the last uh, 11, 12 years. Australia has joined about 10 different multilateral groups in the last 11 years. Um, I counted it up after AUKUS. And there's a whole range of trilaterals that we're doing. The Quad got revived, and we also joined CPTPP and RCEP. Um, the reason it's so critical that we have a US-led um, economic agreement in our region is because the US might and heft can really change the norms, standards, and the ways we actually interact with one another. Because trade agreements aren't just about trade. Um, they're also about security, and the more you become integrated in the economies of other countries, other countries within those groups, the more they rely on you and you rely on them. So your supply chains will become more connected, and you might also start to think about things in a security sense more as a block. So for example, 
when the US left TPP, it used to represent 40% of global GDP. When the US left, it went down to 14%. Um, RCEP represents 30% of global population and 30% of global GDP. The weight of China within um, that agreement means it has disproportionate power to influence how trade happens in our region. And we desperately need the United States to be leading an agreement in our region. That's why even though Australia, Vietnam, Japan, Malaysia were negotiating TPP for nine years with the United States, we are all still back at the table talking to the US, wanting the US to lead this agreement. And I don't think you will find a stronger supporter for um, IPEF than Australia. But, but it's also Vietnam and Malaysia and Indonesia. They're all in IPEF, so they must also want this. I mean, it's not just Japan and Australia, right? That's right. But with anything to do with Southeast Asia, there is a spectrum. So I'd say the highest supporter, you know, within Southeast Asia of IPEF would be Singapore. Um, on the least happy side of the spectrum, I think you would find Malaysia. Um, you know, it's funny, a lot of Southeast Asian nations want the US involved, but I heard some really hilarious quotes. I think they're hilarious, but they're kind of scathing quotes about what Southeast Asians think about IPEF. Um, I heard uh, it's an empty vessel, uh, it's a house of straw, and my personal favourite, it's loud but empty. <laughs> um, so I think one of the main concerns that Southeast Asian nations have about IPEF is they don't want to be forced to choose between the United States and China. They want to have as much choice as possible, which is a great slogan for the US to keep. It's all about choice. Um, I think, though, that uh, they're also concerned about how IPEF might salami slice Southeast Asia. So. You've got in IPEF uh, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, you don't, and Brunei, you don't have Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. So already there's a kind of break. Oh, I forgot Indonesia. Who can forget Indonesia? The most important, They're probably in. ASEAN. Right. Yes. Um, and also the leader of ASEAN this year. Actually, um, from an Indonesian, I heard one of the most positive things about IPEF. Um, it was that strategic competition in the region is good because it can improve efficiency productivity and competitiveness as long as it doesn't create more conflict. Okay, um, uh, let me just pause for one second to say that I should have said that right after this event, in case you were thinking of leaving, there is a reception um, right outside here. Um, no Australian Shiraz, I'm afraid, because we don't allow red wine um, in the building, but there is white wine beer and some other things. So please uh, stick around um, for after this. And the other thing is, I'm going to uh, invite audience questions in a minute, so start thinking about your questions. Um, let me just say, since you um, talked a lot about IPEF and you had earlier said I have some doubts about IPEF, I do, but I would say I'm constructive in the sense that you got 13 other partners who want to engage with the U.S. That's good. The agenda is good. That list of issues is pretty good. Um, and it could be a place where I don't think it's empty. I think there will be some results that will be useful. Um, the reason I then become skeptical is that, you know, will it then feed in? Will those things be incubator? Uh, inc will IPEF be an incubator for then what we ought to be doing, which is rejoining a formal uh, trade negotiation? If it is, then I think it's useful. Um, so, the, but, but I'm skeptical at the moment, that's the, the problem. Um, Emily, um, on, uh, I mean, I'd be interested in more thoughts of yours on IPEF, but let's talk, but I also want to get in the idea of, about the sort of protect side, and you've done a lot of work on, on the semiconductor export and export controls more broadly. Um, how far do you think uh, the U.S. is going to go with this, and how far do you think it's going to expect allies like Australia to follow us? Um, because it seems that there's some discomfort when we actually go down this road. Yeah, great question. Um, maybe I could just tie that briefly into why I think the WTO is important. If we can characterize uh, the IPEF as loud but empty, I think the WTO is full but quiet. We don't really <laughs> <laughs> Good. give it the credit where credit nice. is due. And um, one of the major benefits is that it's one institution. The rules are all there, it gets everyone marching in the same direction, and it creates certainty for businesses and governments. And what we're seeing now with export controls, um, these economic security arrangements, alternative arrangements, you can call them so many different things, uh, is really that we don't have one overarching framework. And I think that will result in 
lost efficiencies over time. One of the biggest lost efficiencies is for the government. It was extraordinarily inefficient to go about these export controls in the way that they did. October 7th happened, they were unilateral, thus ensued an excruciating uh, set of months for the very skeletal staff at the Bureau of Industry and Security, which oversees the export controls. They had to kind of finagle this funky arrangement where the Dutch have done their own deal, the Japanese have kind of come on board with a listing of 23 additional items, but the Netherlands are really only doing EUV. And so we can kind of think of it as two bilateral arrangements that align under this invisible trilateral, which will never produce a solid document. So is that the best way forward? Should we continue to expend tremendous effort on these arrangements that don't actually produce that much clarity at the end of the day. And I think the real value add, again, in Geneva is that there is clarity. It's a good negotiating structure where we can pull allies aside, we can engage through committee meetings, um, and we should probably continue to do that. I think the other thing about incentives and how far will the, the protect elements go uh, that's an, a really good outstanding question, and I think the sky is sort of the limit. It sounds like there's a lot of appetite here that's growing in Washington to bring Korea on board with some of the controls, so that would be a significant expansion in the traditional approach to export controls. The missing piece, of course, is where are the incentives? You know, What's in it for allies? And if you ask uh, people in the government, they'll say, well, we just passed this $52 billion CHIPS Act, or point to the rapidest example in Japan, which is basically um, a pri private public partnership for $2.2 .2 billion that will help uh, Japan produce two nanometer chips. $2.2 .2 billion in the chip sector is not that much. It doesn't build one fab. Uh, so the, I think, next generation of questions for export controls will have to be, how much do we need to spend? And to what degree do these incentives packages need to become iterative in order to convince our allies to come on board? Uh, we're really running thin, I think, on bandwidth and big asks. And uh, if I were Australia, I would think, well, I don't really want to uh, suffer through these export controls. It's a lot of paperwork, headache, the fear of retaliation is very live, uh, especially when there isn't that kind of offsetting mechanism. Okay, great stuff. Um, gosh, we need another hour on each one of these <laughs> topics, but um, we don't have that, so I'm going to take audience questions as soon as I get through one more question with, with Gerard. Which is, Gerard, you're a China intel guy. So what's your intel tell you about what China thinks about all our talk about economic security? And what do they mean by economic security? Do, do, do they feel economically secure, as secure as we think they are? Um, I think they, they have a pretty expansive view of what they think the US is trying to do. So they think that the U.S. is attempting uh, economic and technological containment of China. I don't think that's objectively true, but that's how they see it. Xi Jinping said this in a public speech in March, um, and as a result, uh, he, he also has said that, that, um, that national security is the foundation for development, meaning that they need to prioritize national security above just economic growth. And I think you're seeing that guidance reverberating through the apparatus, particularly on the security side with how they're approaching Western, mostly U.S. firms. Um, there's just, there's new orders to basically maximize the self-sufficiency efforts that have been underway for, well, at least five or six years, but, but certainly below, beyond that. I think their view of economic security is um, tied to a larger concept of called uh, comprehensive national power. So it's, it's, it's holistic, right? So it includes economics, but also military power, diplomatic power, and other things. Um, I don't think they consider themselves to be the equal of the U.S. yet in, in by that broad metric. And so they're still uh, mostly trying to catch up in core areas. The three broad things they worry about are their foreign reliance on technology. So semiconductors gets the most attention, but it's an, not the only one. The second is imported commodities, especially food and fuel. And the third is their reliance on the U.S. dollar. And they have uh, various uh, d dollar for international finance, not for domestic finance. Um, there are various uh, efforts underway to address those things. I think their ability to mitigate those risks is probably in that order that they're making some pretty good strides in the technology space. Commodity reliance is going to be hard to get away from. Getting away from the dollar holistically is probably impossible. Uh, but that's basically where they stand. Okay. Um, 
we've been having a vigorous debate in the economics program about the dollar questions, and, and Gerard has been involved in a separate one on Twitter. Uh, by the way, you should follow <laughs> Gerard on Twitter if you're interested in either economics or cats. Um, <laughs> it's got a very... It's true. Um, Cat or so, um, Okay. Uh, questions from the audience. Um, if you have a question, there's a gentleman back there. Um, please state your name and ask a question. Thanks. Hi, uh, Tom Ramage. Uh, my question is for Emily. Uh, thank you very much for bringing up Korea and all of this, which has signed on to IPEF. Uh, so Korea produces, I think, 70% of the world's memory chips, and um, the U.S. has placed export controls on advanced chip making to China. Uh, countries like Korea have a lot of manufacturing of these chips in China. So I was wondering, um, going into these agreements, if these countries feel caught in between the U.S. and China, and how they might navigate that with these new export controls and IPEF agreement, for example. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I think the answer is, yeah, they do. Uh, if the prevailing attitude in Washington right now is the ABCs, anywhere but China, uh, that really does leave out the uh, third option, which is a pathway in between. And I think Korea is the perfect example of a country who's being forced, potentially through a new tranche of controls, to take a much more hardline and also very public stance uh, about the future of their high-tech sector in China. However, there have been some benefits in the semiconductor sector with Korea. For example, the chip controls had the immediate effect of essentially putting YMTC in China out of business, and Samsung's stock price went through the roof almost immediately. And so there are some kind of uh, interesting caveats where it is not always as bleak as it seems. And I was at a dinner the other night with, uh, I think I was the only non-chip expert there, so it was supremely educational. Uh, but they were saying, look, you can never design a policy about semiconductors and game out all of the possible outcomes because the sector is so immensely complicated. If you look at the gases, for example, that Germany is considering um, controlling the chemical inputs into the semiconductor sector in China, that's its own supply chain. And it's talking about big companies like BASF. So it's really hard to figure out at the end of the day what the effect of the policy will be. And I think that's kind of where, we're, where, where we stand right now with memory chips, is figuring out what that would look like. Because there's definitely a scenario where the controls are too broad, and then we have a situation that looks a little bit like peak COVID-19, where we couldn't access the um, mid-grade chips that go into everyday appliances. Uh, memory chips go into so much of what, what we use every day, they really do power the economy. And if we create an artificial shortage, um, that could affect American firms as well. And a related risk is that if, you know, if we force Ch Korea to sell those fabs to China, I mean the fabs that are in China to Chinese producers, that will accelerate China's capabilities in producing um, sort of dumber chips, I mean the less, <laughs> even if they can't do the more advanced ones, and, and they could end up cornering the market, flooding the market, and, and undercutting our producers that are trying to make money off of that stuff in order to be able to invest in the advanced stuff. I mean, there's lots to worry about, and I'm not saying that it was, I think it was the right policy based on, as it was explained by the White House, the October 7th measures, I, I think, you know, they, they were justified in national security terms, but they do have a lot of unintended consequences or, or questions around them um, that, that are legitimate. Okay, other, other questions? Yes, sir. The gentleman there in the middle. Uh, thank you. My name is Ken Scabbe, uh, Marvini Corporation. So uh, I'm very happy to hear the discussion about CPTPP, which is very rare in Washington, D.C., I think. So uh, I would... CSIS. You're not here. Uh, yeah, it's with CSS, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I want to ask about the uh, Canberra's uh, perspective to on the uh, new uh, applicants on CPTPP, mm -hmm. which is China, Taiwan, and uh, so, yeah, South Uruguay, 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 Uruguay yeah, Uruguay. Costa Rica, yeah. So, uh, how, how, what, what is your plan to, uh, because the, the UK is going to be a new member in CPTP very soon, so maybe the next uh, applicant is China. So, what, what do you plan to uh, deal with yeah. these new applicants? And uh, do you, are you really working on the U.S. to come back to 
the CPTP because maybe uh, you you have to renegotiate with the U.S. with the uh, United States. So I really welcome to the U.S. to to come back to the CPTP. Yeah, all of Japan is waiting for the U.S. Uh, to come back to CPTP because of the question you asked, which is China coming in. But Haley or John, actually John, why don't you yeah. start and then Haley. On the last point, I think unquestionably we'd start talking to the U.S. and renegotiate tomorrow. I mean, we'd begin. So there'd be no barrier at all to having that conversation. No. Um, none whatsoever. On China, Taiwan, etc. I think the honest answer is probably Australia and Japan would talk very closely and continue to talk and continue to talk and continue to talk. <laughs> But basically, on national security grounds, the answer on China is no. You'll hold, you think Canberra will hold that position that's, even, even if that's an interesting two question. or three years from now? That's an interesting question. I think, I mean, I know that would have been the case under Morrison. Um, I think there will be a, a sort of a dance. I mean, Albanese will go to Beijing later this year. It might be one of the things that... China wants to engage on, um, but I think ultimately I actually will continue to look to where Japan is on these things and Australia and Japan will stay, I think, very much in lockstep on that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what Japan's worried about, is that in the end, uh, Australia yeah, well, is going to cave, yeah. that before that, Canada, Singapore will cave. Although yeah. I met the Canadian foreign minister the other day, and I said, you're going to cave on CPTV, and she said, over my dead body. Mm -hmm. See, I so, don't think the uh, economic, like, it's not like, I don't think the economic payoff either is in China is the same. Like, it's just not the same as what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. So the upside for us, is not the same. Right. And the Haley. downside is probably too much. Yeah. Haley. Yeah, I would just say um, I don't think it's helpful to talk about the US rejoining CPTPP because I don't think it will happen. I think that the US has launched IPEF and I wouldn't want it to undercut its negotiations in IPEF by just going back to CPTPP. Um, yes, the US has rebranded other initiatives in the past, like in terms of infrastructure, it used to have um, Build Back Better World, it now has partnerships for global infrastructure and investment, so it rebrands things as it moves. But I think we need to move on from thinking about the US in CPTPP um, and give some life to what IPEF could be. Um, so I'd also say in terms of the membership of CPTPP, yes, we see the UK coming in. Um, Taiwan applied to be a member and then China applied to be a member. And in the midst of this as well, we've got South Korea. South Korea should be in as soon as possible. I, I mean, I thought it should be in before the UK. Um, so what we need to do is help fast track South Korea entering. But I don't feel concerned about China joining CPTPP because frankly, I don't think countries would believe that China would implement the reforms required to be a member. So if China did that, we would happily be welcoming China into the agreement, but I don't see it as a concern. Um, and besides, it has RCEP to continue promoting its values. So that's how I see it. Okay, do we have a, this one more quick question and then I'm gonna invite Mark to come up and, and, and say a few words if you're willing to close us out. If we can have one more question, if not, we can, I know that wine is waiting, <laughs> um, but uh, okay. I mean, this is a really rich conversation. There's a lot more to talk about here and we hope we can do this again and, and continue the conversation in the meantime. But please join me in thanking the panel for this. Thank so we'll just stay, we'll just stay here. We'll just stay here so it's not disruptive. Yeah, go ahead, Mark, please. Thank you, Matthew. That's been a really um, terrific session and also the first session um, my name is Mark Bailey. I have the honour of being the chair of the United States Study Centre. And um, I, I guess uh, in a certain way, I was responsible for uh, bringing Mike across to Australia, so I apologise. Um, we call Mike our uh, rare earth mineral in Australia. He's a catalyst for, for many things, and uh, I think today is an example of that. Um, it's really terrific um, to be here today, but also to be back in the US. Um, for me personally, um, someone who's lived in the US um, about 20 years ago, travelled to the US two or three times a year uh, for the last 25 years, 
Um, this is my first time back in the US um, in, in over three years. Um, and so it's, it's been an interesting journey because during that three years we've had to consume, I guess, um, the interpretation of the US from what we read and see in Australia. And that's sometimes not so positive, but can I say, having been here for the last few days and see what's happening, um, I don't see a country in decline. I don't see um, the sort of um, uh, what's the controversy that we get fed on almost a daily basis in Australia. Certainly, I see a country that's grappling with its growth, and um, you know that has some negative aspects to it. No, no deny, denying that, but. I still see, and I think that's why um, we are here um, from the U.S. Studies Centre and why the U.S. Studies Centre um, was set up. Uh, we see the U.S. as a net for force for good in the world. Um, it's a hugely complex country. Um, the little stat that I used to try and explain that to Australians, in the decade to 2020, the U.S. grew by five Australian economies. So every two years it was adding an Australian economy and um, that is a little bit mind-blowing when you, you put it in that perspective. And so I think we're trying to do in our own small way, just trying to um, unbundle that for Australians um, through both our think tank work uh, but also our academic work uh, where we teach upward of 2,000 students a year. Um, we are really thankful for CSIS. Um, hosting us here. Uh, we had a great dinner um, last night. Um, we, uh, I think there was a young leaders uh, students uh, dialogue today and then we've had this session tonight. Um, so can I just say on behalf of the study centre, thank you. We hope this is the first of many. Um, so that, um, you know, I think it's a, almost a microcosm of um, Australia and the US coming together and grappling with the issues. And there's free and open discussion and disagreement. Um, and I think that's what is, provides the strength of, um, of the relationship. Um, as I say, when I'm asked why do we study the US and Australia, we study because we can and we want to, not because we must and we have to. And with that, I'll finish. Uh, we just have a, a small uh, token of our appreciation, which is a publication uh, you may have seen before, but it's the um, uh, book we produced uh, commemorating the 70th anniversary of uh, the okay. ANZUS Treaty. Wonderful, um, thank so. you. That's for me or for CSIS. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank, thank you all for coming and listening, and please enjoy a glass of wine next door. Thanks. Thank you.